Peter, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Burak, and uh, welcome everybody on this splendid uh, sunny day in Maastricht. Um, um, thanks for joining us today. We had slight technical problems uh, in starting up, so that's why we're a little bit late. My name is Peter Mulgaard, and I'm the Dean of the School of Business and Economics uh, here at Maastricht University. I'm also co-chair of Mas Sustainable, Mas uh, Sustainable UM2030, which is our uh, university-wide sustainability initiative. <coughs> and I'm also moonlighting as a chairman of the Danish Council on Climate Change. So it is my privilege to welcome you to the first episode of our e-conference series on climate neutral cities. Um, it's organized together with the 2OC community uh, here at our beautiful campus in the heart of Europe, Maastricht. At SBE, we feel very honored to trigger a series of discussions, presentations, and to facilitate exchange of ideas on climate neutrality and to, uh, to create awareness in public since our school has uh, three core research uh, areas, sustainability, digitalization, and globalization. You will realize that the conference program also reflects this diversity and the multidisciplinarity uh, of our school. We'll listen to many interesting talks today covering a variety of uh, topics and tools from behavioral aspects uh, to innovation, from social aspects to artificial intelligence. And we want to achieve a particular goal, a climate neutral Europe. Um, in this, cities are crucial for the emissions of greenhouse gases. Most people live in cities and an increasing number of people and an increasing part of the, uh, of, 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 uh, of the planet's population will live in cities. We have big initiatives uh, such as C40 of uh, 40 big uh, cities around the uh, globe, but it's increasingly important also for smaller municipalities. How can they can contribute? For example, they could contribute by greening their purchasing uh, strategies, uh, by ensuring that, that municipal buildings are energy efficient and much, much more. And I'm sure you will um, uh, talk more about that today. Uh, our keynote speaker is Arthur van der Wees. Uh, he's CEO of Arthur's Legal uh, Strategies and Systems, and he'll speak on the three pillars of the European Commission, more green, more digital, and more resilient. This will be uh, followed by <clears throat> a commentary from three panelists from Maastricht University, Professor Dr. Jos Lemming, uh, Professor Dr. Tina Comas, and Dr. Sera Tjokoli. And after that, we'll have nine very diverse and exciting talks from all over Europe. Please feel free to uh, post your the questions uh, on the chat, which will then be asked to the presenters. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this first episode of uh, this conference series. You'll find the link to subscribe for the upcoming episodes in the chat. And um, I don't want to postpone further, so I will give the, leave the floor to the moderator for the day. And, and before I do that, I have to thank him uh, fiercely for setting this up, all, all this up, but also for organizing the 2OC community and the 2OC uh, Horizon um, Consortium. Uh, I wish you all a sustainable uh, Wednesday. Over to you, Boak. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for your uh, kind words. Uh, now, I also want to cut it very... Uh, 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 short. It's my privilege to introduce Arthur van der Weijs, a CEO of Arthur's Legal Strategies and Systems, and he's going to uh, deliver a lecture uh, based on the three intertwined uh, pillars, as also mentioned uh, by Ursula van der Leyen's work program of the European Commission, more green, more digital, and more resilient. Over to you, Arthur. Good morning. Good morning. Name, right? Yeah. Clear. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Arthur, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for the introduction and Burak as well. And indeed, a big thanks to Burak uh, organizing this uh, with all the team members. Uh, the CO2 community is quite big. It will hopefully become even more bigger, uh, and I'm very happy to be part of it. Uh, so, uh, looking forward to the the, the whole day. 
Um, indeed, I'm going to uh, try to you know, boil in in 20 minutes uh, a lot of topics. Uh, I tried to. Uh, I had to kill my darlings for that, of course. Um, I, I will not be able to talk about the Green Deal initiative in length, the data strategy, the cybersecurity strategy, the circular economy action plan, uh, the diversity strategy, the farm to fork strategy, and the just leaked out regulation uh, on a European approach for AI uh, that uh, was uh, leaked yesterday. Um, of course, I'm happy to talk about it uh, in panels and, and questions, so please feel free. Um, but in, in this case, I'm going to try to boil it down to five notions uh, that hopefully are helpful, uh, not only for today, but also after. The, um, the three pillars is, is not necessarily something that is being marketed like the three pillars uh, by the Commission, but they are very clearly mentioned indeed, as already Burak mentioned, in the working program 2021. Um, the quote you see here is uh, a quote from the, um, uh, the, the actually the um, State of the Union of the EU. Um, links are pro provided. I can't work through them all. But indeed, more green, more digital, more more resilient. I think these three actually um, sum it up quite nicely. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of there's only six words. I'm a lawyer, education, and an, an attorney at law, uh, and writing regulations in Europe uh, and also standards. Um, uh, beyond uh, the EU. So, um, you know, I, I see only six words and I can, of course, go on for that for a long time, which I won't do. But what I'm also, on, I'm an entrepreneur. And um, so is this, I, I highlighted in orange, uh, you know, the fact that there is a lot of hope there uh, be given. And of course, I see it as well. And I'm quite happy to, to hope to get the vibe out to, to you as well on, you know, the opportunities that um, creates, um, uh, you know, climate change. I mean, it, I'm not I want to be, yay, we have climate change, but it's, you know, it's a big, huge um, post-European global topic uh, that we can't take care of ourselves only, but we need to uh, take it uh, by ourselves as well. So it's a very nice combination of being, you need to be part of the team as well as being able to, um, uh, to look outside. It's not a why, uh, the, the, the why anymore, um, according also to uh, uh, official research also by the commission, but you can read that yourself in that working program, um, uh, nine out of 10 um, uh, in European Union, uh, understand the why. Uh, so we're moving on and, and I can, you know, I love to talk about how, because that's how to enable this, how to quick, um, um, you know, um, uh, increase the activities, how to improve it. And not only are the activities good enough, uh, are, are we moving on the right path here or do we need to, you know, pivot? And I'm all about challenging uh, anybody. That's where I start. So notion number one is the following. Our, our three pillars, if you talk about green, digital, Resilience, and I will dive into resilience a bit more. Are these horizontals or verticals, right? Are these, these, we are still thinking in verticals. Corporates, sectors, markets, ministries, departments in any country are still uh, um, verticals. And these topics uh, are actually horizontals. They are, you know, shooting, they are crossover, they are cross border, they, they, they do not uh, adhere to our uh, of, uh, current thinking of that we can organize stuff in, 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 in sec sectorial mode. In a um, in vertical, so we need to start thinking about cross cutting and integrating that. It's going to be challenging, but I think that's actually where the the edge is. The fact that you know none none of the verticals can do it alone, and therefore they need to join forces. And that's why I'm so you know happy with this part. And the intertwinedness, as already Burak mentioned, is also in the title of this uh, presentation is um, uh, is. Uh, is quite clear, and I'm going to try to explain it to you what it means. If you add on the left side green, more green, to societal challenges, and these are 12 societal challenges that we have been identifying with the Institute of Future of Living, which I'm part of, uh, but they are th these are um, uh, very much uh, in the straight. They, they, these are synchronized to the societal challenges, how we uh, have defined our words in, within, uh, at least on European Commission, European Union level. If you think of all the com, com, commissions nowadays, we have, for instance, even have a commission on the demography, which I think is quite important. And if you add, if you look at, at more green, more digital, more resilient, and you 
pick out your, let's say, most urgent challenge, um, and then you add a couple of those um, next to it. Um, so you can do climate change as the big one, or resilience, which is societal challenge nine in this case, can be climate resilience, can be community resilience, or social resilience, and cyber resilience, of course nowadays as well then uh, on the other side you know you get to something that is loaded that some uh, that you you can team up with <clears throat> people understand challenges it's a great place to start uh, and then uh, <clears throat> figure out which stakeholders are applicable and um, what kind of values each each of the parties have we all have different values depending on where we look at this particular challenge uh, and then we can actually start moving on so that's the first one but of course it's not about people only um, uh, if you would read the water law in the Netherlands, uh, but the, the uh, uh, water resilient regulation is sort of the same in other countries in the European Union as well. Now, number one is uh, society uh, and people. Number two is, uh, or number three is ecology and four is economy. But in my point of view, and also what you see is that it needs to be combined. It can't be only ecology, it can't be only economy, it can't be only society or only people. There needs to be a combination, a symbiosis of these four. Uh, there needs to, it needs to be invested in. Uh, there, we need to th think about, you know, that certain investors will need to return on investment, and that is fine as long as we know it. Uh, are they able to do a little bit less, so a little bit lower return on investment, so we have a margin to invest that in impact? That would be great. So those kind of things we need to think about. This is not only about uh, climate change and then, you know, uh, on the ecology side. The second notion is um, is uh, we were looking from the smart cities approach and the the, the climate neutral cities or resilient cities. Uh, then uh, it's always nice to have, for instance, a bottom up approach looking from your own home. And what can I do in my own home to to have no energy to to use it to no not use anything at all? And then of course you find out that sometimes you will need some. Um, the community is the is the next layer, uh, which is can, can be your your physical community, but also your more you know virtual community. It can be a combination in this 21st century, and we're moving every a a um, a, a circle to it further and further. And and I'm just want to show, of course, the the yellow circle all the way at, at the end. This is not only for European Commission or European Union stuff or city stuff or national. Um, government's uh, um, uh, interest. This is, this is definitely something that is go going far beyond, as I already mentioned, and we should um, you know, uh, accept that and, and acknowledge it. Instead of saying, you know, when we talk at ni nitrogen, that um, uh, 60, uh, 33, uh, 36, no, 36 percent of the nitrogen in the, uh, in, in the Netherlands comes out of uh, other countries. Well, that means also that stuff that we generate goes to, 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 to there. So, you know, we should not only look in it inverse, but we should have an outward uh, look as well. And the nice thing is, if you talk about, you know, business, and it can be ethical, uh, highly ethical business and social business, but also just commercial business, you know, if you want to make money with this, why not? <coughs> There is also a, a huge opportunity for cities, regions, countries, member states, European Commission to also use this as, um, as new products, new services, new, new learnings. And you can either for profit or for uh, of, of non for profit share those uh, with the com community far outside the EU. And I think we need to do that uh, regarding that because climate change is not something limited again to only uh, our the places where you and I live. It also very nicely fits into... Um, into the uh, the five uh, P's from the Euro uh, from the United Nations. They're not three P's anymore already for a long time. We still think about uh, people still talk about people, planet, profit. The word profit is not in its prosperity, and that's more than only making money. Even though making money is is of course uh, part of it, but not only. So it fits nicely. And of course, I also saw your banner at your uh, your room, uh, Peter, from the S Sustainable Development Goals. Um, much appreciated. Uh, I have some cows here, but anyway, um, it's um, uh, if you if you look at the societal challenges. Uh, the, 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 sorry, the Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 of them and all the 169 targets that are under those SDGs, then if you, if you look at more green, more digital, more resilient, you sort of, uh, you catch them all. I'm not saying it's an all-catcher, it's not that obvious, but you're able to also get this filter in to see and to balance it out as a, as a, as a, uh, 
validator to see whether we are forgetting anything because all the way up and it's also been said on the website and uh, of this um, conference you know we should think about not leaving anybody behind and it's not only people that we should not leave behind right so uh, nobody is not only people the, the third notion is the digital side where we're moving from a standalone approach from uh, uh, to uh, to cyber physical connectivity so nowadays you know, cyber cyber is also um, physical, which means that cybersecurity is safety, but also that means that we can, you know, use it. Um, and if we do it well, then we can actually uh, use it as an, an, an enabler to um, to expedite. Because we only have 29 years left until 2050, uh, both for the Paris Treaty, both for the Green Deal, even though the SDGs are already 2030, which is only in nine years. So this is not, um, um, still we think that digital is fun and nice and it should be fun, but it's not only nice to have, it's definite need to have in order to solve these big issues. We can't just ask a municipality or a national government or the private sector to take care of it. We, we have seen it doesn't work because it's too big, it's too uh, complex and that's why, you know, I think we need to team up. To do that, uh, it's always good to uh, know what we're talking about. Digital sounds a little bit like, oh, it's somewhere out there, with uh, zeros and, uh, and, and, and ones. But you know, it, it is just um, a stuff that you can touch uh, at the end of the day. The whole internet is owned by all components and certificates are owned by particular organizations. Uh, and it, 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 we need to understand that and then figure out with whom uh, we, we, we should work or should not work or if we can get people that we need to get on board to also uh, and, and endorse what we want to do. So a more sustainable digital systems with consume less en energy in data rooms is part, uh, part of that. But what is their competitive edge for that? So how can we help them and then also market that, that particular capability? And the other one is uh, quite important, um, uh, is that the internet is just a tool. It, it doesn't do this or that, it's people. Uh, and that's good because it's not out of our hands, it's not out of our control, it's totally in our control. And um, if we think that it's all happening at the place that we could not have any influence, then we're wrong. And um, I can invite you and I can and prove that that's actually the case. So let's make sure that we... You know, we, we are, as people need to take care of AI. We need to ca take care of what can sensors contribute to uh, um, uh, neutral city, to climate neutral cities. How can we balance out the new, uh, you know, paradigm shift of electricity use when we have all um, uh, battery plat platforms that are driving and we hook them up in the, in the evening to, you know, um, light up our, 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 our homes. Which means that the, the, the grid is, 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 no, uh, is not designed for that and we need to think about those kind of things. But it's not only about human-centric and the good thing, of course, the Commission, European Commission uh, designs all regulations and directives and, and our other policy instruments from a human-centric perspective. But I want to add a new layer to it or a new p a thinking to it, which we already do for a while, is persona-centric. And persona means that you, know, you as an individual have multiple personas during the day and even at the same time. So also or quantum style, you know, as an individual in the middle, you have a massive amount of, uh, of persona while traveling, while uh, shopping, while um, uh, being in a university or being an entrepreneur, either, you know, self-employed or, or not. And these persona all need to be taken care of. And it's so we can't only think that the identity of me is myself author. No, I have some multiple um, persona during the day. And in that way, we can very well and easy pinpoint also, um, um, uh, you know, a digital ecosystem architect it so it can help out with more green, more digital and more resilient. I'm going quite fast. I'm conscious of time. Um, the notion four is uh, going back to the commission when uh, we have now a new commission since uh, almost one and a half years and our commissioner uh, from, from digital and also internal affairs, DG Grow, uh, is um, uh, Commissioner Breton. And when he was asked, uh, you know, what is your priority? And of course, then, you know, is it 5G or AI or, you know, what are you going to focus on? Um, and, and his answer was, uh, I, and I, I'm, I'm still very happy to quote him on that um, his answer was that the common denominator, you know, that runs through all the activities, and I'm here in the, the digital and the, and the cyber and the cyber physical domain, is data. 
Um, and data, of course, only for letters. That it's a huge set of, of that, but it definitely co co correct. It's very good to have a data-centric approach. We're not having that yet uh, too much. And we need to, in, in, instead of looking only at the process, like people process tech, technology that we all have learned, you know, um, uh, at university or, or college or anywhere, but, you know, we forgot basically that, you know, data is part of it. So in the tetrahedron that you can see here, uh, and I put it a, a, a two-dimensional two to make sure that it's not one is more important than the other. Um, you know, data, adding data to the equation is not only uh, uh, um, makes a lot of sense, but it's also essential. And you can see there are different categories of, uh, of data. If you, if you structure data, you get to information. And if you, you know, use data of information, you get knowledge and experience. And of course, we can double loop that back to, uh, to, with data to data and information. And with that, we can uh, you know, uh, improve our, our, our ways and, and continuously monitor what we're doing and improve it. But of course, digital is great. I love it. I'm a nerd, but um, you know, I'm also an attorney at law. Uh, so we need to take and think about you know the, the legal perspectives and the ethical perspectives to it. Uh, and just a couple here, you can see on on the left, you see more the the individual persona part, uh, but not they also uh, applicable, of course, on the on the data centric uh, on uh, on 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 your right. Um, and accountability uh, is a term that definitely is part of it, not only uh, in more green and or more digital, but also in resilience. So if things go wrong, what what happens then, right? This is how you you build up trust and that people can understand that you know you are accountable and you have thought about it, the what if uh, scenarios, and that's quite important. Data control is just one term I want to use. The word control is the word that we need to think about. Not ownership, the city or sensor uh, owners or um, um, uh, citizens do not own data. They could, I'm, I'm talking about the digital data here, you know, but they have certain control. And that's where we need to co come up with uh, a balanced out structure so that citizens, uh, people, tourists, uh, visitors, students, everybody that comes to the city of Maastricht or anywhere else, can uh, can uh, you know appreciate uh, the services that are pro provided and what's happening with their data, uh, but not only from that perspective, also from again open data perspective, and also from commercial data perspective. This is a mix we need to find, like you know cooking in a kitchen and find the right mix, uh, mix to get to the one, two, or three star Michelin uh, cooking. But it can also be just a fast food approach. Why not? Depending on uh, on on the need. So the last notion is uh, an interesting one. This is a um, already a, a little bit dated research, a quantitative, uh, a quantitative research by uh, Eurostat, the Statistic Bureau of the, of the European Union, uh, where they ask, you know, um, uh, medium-sized, uh, mid-sized organizations, uh, now what is your blocking factor on not using digital tech technology? In this case, the question in particular was about cloud computing, but I made it a little bit more abstract. And the, the fun thing is that it was not security, it's not data protection or personal data protection like the GDPR, and it's not compliance. Um, and and uh, generally people see, uh, say either, either of these three, uh, three uh, things. It's insufficient knowledge. And what the boonit kent dat eten niet, it is difficult to, uh, to translate in English, but it's very uh, much a, 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 a Dutch saying already from hundreds of years ago, probably. Uh, basically, you know, if, if, if it's unknown, then, then you're not going to enter. And, uh, and it makes a lot of sense. Why would a municipality or uh, the private sector or the public sector or other public sector, you know, uh, engage or deploy or procure if they don't know what, what happens with it? So it makes a lot of sense. And, uh, um, it, I think it's very important to, to get there. And how do we get there? Uh, we can get there and we think about the four T's. Uh, it's something that we use all over the world. We've done it in South Korea. We've done it in the U.S. We've done it here in, in, uh, uh, in Europe, of course. We know we are start with coming, getting a common ground. What is the, 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 the common, it's not a, it's not a level playing field. That is not what I'm talking about. That's a common ground. Where are we coming from? Where, what is a solid footing to start from? And te taxonomy, so what are we talking about really? Uh, if we talk about internet of things or we talk about green or sustainable, what does it mean? Uh, you know, it's quite important to get on the same page and then start, you know, moving along. Uh, the transparency part, as already mentioned, is uh, is pivotal to get to trust. You know, if you don't know, then it's insufficient knowledge, then you're not engaging. I will give an example. If you would be in an autonomous um, public transportation shuttle, 
uh, with, with has four LIDARs, radar, uh, uh, LIDARs in the front, four at the left and right, and four at the back. So 16 LIDARs. And it drives without a driver. Here in Europe, there are uh, multiple cities where it's driving already in, in, in large-scale pilots. It feels like, you know, magic, and it's, we talk about autonomous. But as soon as you see the screen and what the radar, the LIDARs are doing, and based on what why is behaving, we, talk, we, we, we call it automation, because we, we start to understand it. Um, and it's already less, uh, you know, evasive and less scary to, to engage. Again, these things need to be mixed up with the, uh, to, uh, to get to the right mix. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the right mix here. I've, I've seen uh, there are multiple speakers this uh, later today that will talk about it. But I do want to give one more thing uh, adding to it. Trust is not something that you can do today and say, hey, here is my certificate. Here are the terms and con conditions. Here is my, my car or here is my, uh, you know, my, my mini grid or my nano grid. Everything is fine. You know, there's consistency in time that we need to uh, uh, work on. Uh, and that's going to be a big challenge, uh, and that's what we need to talk about. So, uh, in uh, to end of uh, there, I talked about five notions. I'm not going to repeat them all, but you know the intertwined horizontals, um, um, and and uh, use green in an in a sector that they're not really particular thinking about. That is a way to you know slightly confuse them, and then see whether it gives oxygen to move forward, right? Or add digital to a sector that is doing mostly green uh, and do the same approach. This is, this is what you, uh, what, what at least what, what we would recommend and uh, what we do already for a long time. And I can tell you it works. It's fun. Not everybody will be in mild confusion. Some will be very much confused. Hey, uh, you can't get them all, but uh, probably you get to 20, 30%, which is already quite nice. To, uh, to start with. Uh, the other ones I already mentioned, but I just wanted to summarize them. And you now see that the intertwinedness is coming from the left. And now we are in a, a hopefully uh, moving towards climate neutral cities, which will not be easy. Uh, we can't, you know, retrofit everything in. We can't, I mean, in 1906 building here, and now, uh, you know, we have been able uh, to uh, get it to uh, a, a label A, an energy label A++, eight years ago, running on a green wind energy. Uh, but I can tell you it's very expensive, uh, and we need to also make sure it's affordable, that others can, you know, see what we have done, but also can do it better than I did, right? That is what we're quite happy of. So that's it, Burak. Um, this is the, um, uh, the societal challenges, which are the roots, and then they grow up into uh, the five Ps of the United Nations, and they also, again, totally uh, chime uh, and ha harmonize with uh, the activities of the three pillars of the Commission. Thank you very much, Arthur, for this very inspiring and uh, exciting talk. Uh, now we will just uh, spice it up and then put some uh, cherry on top with the three fantastic panelists. Uh, I'd like to give now the floor to our first discussant, Tina Combs, uh, Professor of Decision Making and Digitalization at Maastricht University. Her work focuses on collaborative and informational aspects of resilient societies. Uh, over to you, Tina. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, wait. Wait. So, uh, yeah, very happy to, to be here as well. And definitely after this, uh, these great introductions, um, I think we are still seeing Arthur's screen. I will try to share mine. Ah, thank you. Um, and I already saw some questions in the chat about what is resilience. And that comes very handy because that's what I've been working on and will also talking, be talking about. Um, Share. So now you should be able to all see my slides, if that's correct. Yeah, I suppose so. Yes. <laughs> Good. Correct. So I was, I, and I also only have five minutes, so I will keep it very, very short. Um, yeah, it was already introduced. Uh, I'm working on decision making and digitalization. And in this uh, presentation, I'm focusing on doing that for resilience. I'm working for the, um, for the data department, which really looks at data analytics and digitalization. And I apply that to uh, resilience. So I'm already bringing at least two of the pillars that were just talked about together. Um, good, but what is resilience? So here is, there are many definitions of resilience. Um, but here is one, uh, the, the one that I typically use. And yes, that also means it's different from robustness. 
So resilience is the ability of a social technical or social technical environmental system to sustain its key functions in response to chronic stresses or abrupt shocks. So that means it is both the ability to rapidly recover from a disaster, like we are now all living through, but also the uh, adaptive capacity to get better and adapt to these uh, chronic stresses that we are all facing. Um, and how do these systems do that on a very high abstraction level? It's through absorption, like absorbing a shock, uh, responding to it, quickly recovering to it, adapting and reorganization. So we have in, in this concept combined the notion of uh, sort of the, um, yeah, the technical resilience, the, the adaptation, the robust systems and so forth, as well as then the uh, emergence, the learning, the transformation and adaptation. Okay, so why is this important at all? And I mean, that was a question that I got uh, two years ago, much, much more than I get now, but it's not only the pandemics. I just took a screenshot this morning from GDAX, that is the alert system uh, between the UN, the European Com Commission and hosted by the JRC. So that gives you sort of all the disaster alerts in the world that are going on currently. That's the last four days. So, <laughs> Uh, you see there are disasters happening everywhere in the world. And of course, also some regions are more, more vulnerable to this, to this than others. That's why the World Bank also had um, a report out two years ago that was called Lifelines that tried to quantify um, the effect of uh, improving resilience. And they called that report and they marketed it as the $4.2 trillion opportunity which is the net benefit of investing in resilience in infra of infrastructure in low and middle income countries only. So if you then add like the, 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 the more developed countries to that um, bill, you see that it's also economically very, very attractive to improve uh, our systems and infrastructure systems. And especially in a time where we are renewing lots of infrastructure anyway, because we are dealing with agent infrastructures, because we all know we have to rethink our cities. So this is really the moment and the opportunity to, to grab it. And it was also already said, of course, the European Commission has realized that, and it was uh, stressed before that now it is not only a bit uh, about any more like, do we need to do this? It is about how do we implement it, whereby I do have to say that, you know, at a more sort of local or practical level, um, there is still there is still some hesitation because, of course, the costs that you make with investing in resilience are here now, whereas the net benefits will be realized over time. So there is still some some friction in that concept. Um, yeah, and then I will, uh, I just have, because I have so short time, just uh, two major challenges that I see in there. First is uh, monitoring and measuring. Um, because resilience is still very broad and is applied to many sectors and notions. On the left, you see an urban resilience framework that has been developed by Arup for the Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities that tries to um, sort of qualify the, the uh, the capacities that a city needs to have to be resilient. Um, some of the cities that I've been working with call that thing the wheel of death <laughs> because it is so complicated and so cumbersome to fill in and it's really a huge process. Then on the right, that is the, the WHO, the WHO um, monitoring dashboard for health, the Global Health Observatory, which was actually interestingly very much revamped during the COVID crisis. So I was always saying how bad that had rated the countries. And I was looking at it when I, when I prepared for this talk and they have completely re revamped that dashboard um, because they realized through COVID that it's not anymore about just the care that is provided in hospitals like intramuros but that it's about more like public health problems, institutions, governance, how people react and respond. And for that, of course, to, to measure that, we need uh, much broader notions. Uh, what all of these, both of these dashboards or, or ways to measure resilience have in common is that it's, that it's very hard and a very hard process based on statistical data that is normally only yeah, collected uh, once per year or even less often. So it's um, it's not a tool that you can use to keep on top of a dynamic development like the COVID situation now or a very dynamically changing city. 
Still, also the European Commission, JRC, is working with these quite static dashboards instead of using data-driven approaches. And the final word, so I, I do think there's lots of opportunities and also research opportunities to improve that. Um, also because many of these resilience frameworks and indicator models are not very well empirically validated. So we do think that, for instance, empowered stakeholders help our cities be resilient, but we can't really say that is true or it's not true. And then, of course, the second one, um, the question of behavioral change. So COVID has, of course, demonstrated and, and shown us that behavioral change um, is possible. And that's a picture from, from New Delhi, once in smog and once in, in lockdown. And many of us have appreciated, and there were pictures on Twitter and about the, the blue air that we all of a sudden had and the much higher environmental uh, quality. So we see that it is possible, but where it is now uh, causing a lot of friction is for, for how long? Can we just, can we only always have uh, like sort of peaks in our behavioral change and then we sort of deteriorate back to normal? And how can we make sure that, you know, this behavioral change becomes what was just said, sustainable. So how can we connect this short-term change to longer-term strategic uh, change and policy? Now, also that is not easy because there was beginning of this year uh, an article in Nature where a couple of researchers have looked into what are the impacts of crisis. Um, and very often the crisis leads to investment in technical infrastructure, like in the Netherlands, for instance, uh, the Delta plan, all the dikes that have been built and so forth. Um, one of my female colleagues calls that boys with toys. Um, but there is uh, very little policy change. So we seem to be more willing to um, invest massively and learn in, from a crisis through um, buying technology, investing in things, rather than changing, for instance, policy or also our behavior. And then one of the final, um, final aspects that was, we did a review on resilience in research and in practice that is for urban resilience, um, use some data mining approaches because there's a lot of literature definitely uh, in the academic side. So that was uh, 37,000 papers we had to go through there. Um, but we see also there that there are huge gaps between what uh, academic literature focuses on in terms of resilience versus what, um, yeah, what, uh, what uh, practice wants and is working on. So there's also room to bridge and address that gap. Okay, I will leave it at that. It was not exactly seven minutes, sorry, Burak. No problem. Thank you very much, Tina, for this lovely discussion. I'd like to immediately give the floor uh, to our second discussant, Jos Lemming, professor, professor of Marketing and uh, service innovation at Maastricht University. He's also the founder of Service Science Factory and has a lot of research on smart cities and uh, smart tools. Joost, uh, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Burak. Um, so, actually, uh, I would like, I, I was doubting whether to uh, discuss uh, one or two topics, eh? and uh, given the limited time, I chose for two. Um, and that's, of course, a non-logical uh, decision, but uh, I would like to discuss um, the optimism or the pessimism regarding um, the, um, the, the problems that we are going to face in, in the near future. Huh? So are cities the engines of economic growth? Um, or, and is it the foundation of our prosperity? Or is it something else? Huh? Is it a sort of a threat that we have to cope um, with? And um, is it something that we should worry a lot about? Huh? And I came across uh, this book of uh, Matthew Kahn, uh, Climatopolis. Uh, it's already written 10 years ago, but I talked to him and he was able to share uh, optimism. Huh? And he said, well, in fact, we do have these handles, we do have more data, we do have a lot of opportunities to bend it in the direction of uh, flourishing cities. So um, this is, um, let's see if I can move my slide. Yeah, so 
this uh, let me think uh, let us think eh, from a business perspective because i'm a prof professor at the business school head eh? so that's the school that burak is also working in and also is organizing this uh, seminar and you have to imagine that um, that there's a lot of research done from a business perspective as well so if i look at uh, new urban configurations and configuration for the configurations for the future I think uh, we should not overlook uh, factories, for instance, or schools, or stores, or recreation areas, or um, the cultural sector. And also, of course, what is very straightforward and has been studied a lot, the mobility in cities, but also healthy buildings and sensors. So, so these are ingredients for decision making on the policy level but also ingredients for the decision-making on the individual level. And are we prepared for these decisions? And how involved are we with these decisions that we have to take in the near future? So we will be, as students of ours will be policy makers uh, in the future. Um, we are uh, heavily involved in policy making at this moment as well. So this means that um, th there's a lot of touch points with universities and a lot of touch points with education. So I would like to focus uh, in the next couple of minutes, uh, um, focus at, at education in general, but especially education in business schools. Don't forget that one in five students that walk around and that you meet in the streets and that are studying, that are uh, following lectures that are doing research, uh, one in five uh, is studying at a business school or a, a school of economics. So business and economics, I take these two disciplines uh, together. So uh, this means that this is an enormous force uh, uh, for the future and that we should start now to integrate um, the topics into the education, into the courses. And as, um, as, as Tina already um, mentioned, 37,000 research papers on the topic, eh? uh, only the topic on uh, resilience and, 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 and uh, topics that, that are related to re resilience. So a lot is going on, but are we also talking about it? Are we communicating um, what we are teaching, uh, what we are researching, and is this good enough? So uh, I have a sort of a positive uh, view on, uh, on the future that we can do, that we can change things, but it should, should be done by individuals. And this is also what Artu was uh, saying about the, um, the, uh, the personas and also the individual choices that uh, we all have to make. And so there's policy makers that take uh, decisions for us, uh, for the community, for a society, and there's individuals who continuously from second to second take decisions that would harm or would uh, improve uh, the living circumstances. So um, talking about um, the communication. So one in five students uh, study at business schools, and this is schools of business and economics. So what we did is we uh, analyzed the uh, communication of business schools, uh, and we collected for over 10 years, uh, half a million tweets. Uh, it's the official Twitter accounts of business schools. And what you see is that over the years, there is an increase of, um, uh, communication about sustainability, uh, social responsibility, climate, um, labor circumstances, um, uh, CO2 neutrality, uh, climate, etc. So um, it might surprise you, but it's only 10%. Eh? So of all communication that we are uh, spreading and also to our, our stakeholders, students, research, uh, institutions, governments, uh, business schools communicate only one in 10 um, um, of the volume of communication. They, they spend this uh, uh, 
uh, talking about sustainability in, in a broad sense. So, and it's increasing. Eh? It's increasing in the past uh, years. And um, this is um, more or less equally spread around the globe. Eh? You see that uh, this communication is increasing to 10% uh, in um, all parts of the world. So there are no differences. Eh? There's a lot of talk of the town, as to speak. Um, what are they talking about? We also did some te text analysis of these tweets. And um, what you see is that they talk a lot about uh, industry, about diversity, inc inclusivity. And this is social respons uh, res responsibility. What we did is we um, collected uh, the, um, uh, the information um, on topics, and we selected the topics that were related to consumer social, or sorry, uh, corporate social responsibility. So, um, and it turned out that uh, part of this communication is indeed about uh, um, uh, uh, resources, energy management, uh, and also um, a lot about social uh, values and impact and CSR and business is also a topic that we were able to identify. So, so these are the topics that we as business schools, eh, again, 20% eh, of the student population uh, is, is studying in business schools and probably um, also a fairly high share of academics and teachers and professors. Um, then the next slides uh, shows us the um, the different topics over time. And you see that there is almost no change, right? So resource and energy is still a sort of a minor part of all communication about CSR. So um, I think this requires more attention. And of course, communication is not the only thing. And we also should build it into our courses in our more in our research and of course the european framework and also the national schemes will help us uh, to do that but if you uh, look at a business school or the school of economics as a funnel and there's a lot of opportunities there at the top of the funnel and if you look at uh, in the end what are we talking about how are we communicating what are we proud of then you see that resources and energy is still a limited percentage of our communication. So this is my presentation. So um, uh, the con my conclusion would be there is a lot of opportunity to increase uh, attention to, to climate, to sustainability uh, topics uh, in the near future, and there's room for uh, improvement there. Thank you, Jos, very much for this uh, lovely discussion and presentation. I would like to immediately give the floor to our third discussant, and I'd like to uh, announce uh, one thing. Uh, please uh, ask your questions on the chat screen, but uh, because of the technical uh, hiccup that we had in the beginning, I will ask Arthur if you would be so kind enough to answer the list of questions that uh, we will provide in the chat, also via the chat screen, if you could take the time for that after the panel discussion. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, my plan was to give you the floor once more, but I mean, uh, because of my uh, mistakes, uh, I have to cut on a few things. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to present you now. I'm, it's my privilege to uh, present you Dr. Sardar Turkili, researcher at the uh, Research on Innovation, Institution and Development Specialization at United Nations University Merit uh, at the School of Business and Economics. He's also founder of the SDG Lab at Unimerit. Uh, Sardar, over to you. Yeah. I apologize that I will have thank to cut much. a bit more from you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Brad, and uh, thank you, Arthur uh, van der Fez, for a very inspiring uh, talk. So I will be uh, to the point, and uh, I also want to thank Tina and Jos for their uh, very important remarks. So uh, more green, more digital, more resilient. There is definitely a degree of comprehensiveness here because uh, all of these... Um, domains uh, rely on droves information on disciplinary traditions, and they are very intellectually agile in bringing out uh, the solutions for the societal challenges. But uh, we just uh, uh, start to observe a formation of 
uh, uh, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research and teaching need in this multidisciplinary environment. And definitely this would have an impact in the research teams in the uh, universities or in the industry. So um, it's true that these uh, disciplines are um, very uh, agile or ardent, if you want, uh, in their knowledge domains, but it would require some time uh, for this different uh, disciplinary domains to create these horizontals, if I refer to uh, Arthur's uh, position about verticals and horizontals. This is definitely true. Uh, so for instance, for um, uh, more green, we have the leading flagship uh, domain of environmental sciences, engineering and ecology from science policy perspective. And uh, for more digital, we, we just can see the flagship of computer sciences and mathematical models. And for resilience, uh, the politics and economy, especially the economics of information, uh, data, economics of uh, politics. So we definitely need some uh, flagship uh, domains to create this inter and transdisciplinary research and teaching, uh, doing science with and for society. We have these originators, especially in Europe, and uh, too many solutions are already existing in the uh, 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 techno-economic domain. But to what extent they are scalable is a very big question. So uh, in order for these uh, solutions to be scalable, they should be effective enough, big enough, simple enough, and uh, uh, cheap enough. So when we look at the um, transition from solutions to scalable solutions, we have this constraint and we then immediately see a more green, more digital and more uh, resilient is a kind of uh, journey because it's about uh, scaling uh, maybe Europe-wide and as Arthur mentioned, uh, globally as well. So the destination point is the system change, that's true, um, but uh, the scaling uh, covers too many different intermediary states. So what does it mean? I have background in computational uh, computer sciences and uh, engineering, business administration, political science, public administration, and economics and econometrics. I actively work on innovation for sustainability through governance and policy. And when I activate my uh, background knowledge and working knowledge so far, I see between the, the uh, initial condition like no green, no digital and no resilient like zero, zero, zero to one, 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 like green, digital and uh, resilient. Uh, it makes uh, in total eight different stages and uh, in the combinatorial uh, thinking. Even with this uh, reductionist computational thinking, we can just see very pretty much intermediary states. So for instance, more green is not uh, necessarily always uh, translating into more digital. We can maybe in fact get rid of some uh, digital uh, aspects of our uh, modern life as well. So when we just see the interactions, we just see that uh, there's always a social component uh, is uh, embedded in the uh, interaction. So for instance, a green activity, and if there's a kind of digital app which will uh, assure uh, energy efficiency and on top of it, resource efficiency, just like sharing apps uh, in our daily lives, these uh, could uh, scale uh, the impact. Uh, actually more green, uh, more digital, not always uh, uh, resilient as well. So for instance, just imagine in a cloud day, a solar park. So uh, that will not uh, contribute directly to energy security and energy supply, but we have solutions for that technological solutions uh, like uh, energy storage or social solutions like as, uh, energy citizenship. So uh, these intermediary states uh, also give us uh, being able to be critical to um, green domain, uh, to what extent these domains uh, uh, could be greener uh, or digital domain, to what extent the digitalization uh, create some energy efficiency as well as resource efficiency. So, in that aspect, I have questions to uh, Arthur about the uh, um, uh, legal perspective and the interaction of the legal perspective with the political administrative domain. Uh, it's very straightforward, well-coded via regulations and standards and the regulatory uh, sandboxes in the techno-economic domain. But uh, I would like to ask more about the citizens lab because if we just concretely look at the outcomes of this uh, argumentation, we definitely need uh, financial and investor transparency 
and uh, for new entrepreneurs, for new um, uh, investments, who, who funds them, who funds the financiers as well. So a degree of supply chain transparency for entrepreneurs and consumers. Consumers have sustainable, inclusive intentions. They do the action, but it's not enough in order to create impact. We do not know where these goods and services come from, under what conditions they are being uh, produced, as well as price transparency, the real price of the products. We don't have uh, information about it. Just like you said, not knowing it, not create uh, trust. These are all depending on the data transparency in the uh, structure of the economy, starting from uh, uh, not even sourcing the materials or uh, uh, financing the sourcing activities. So that degree of transparency with the right amount of simplification and um, uh, accountability, I think is needed fundamentally uh, without uh, any uh, uh, stepping around uh, to build the trust between the uh, citizens and as well legal transparency for uh, startups uh, to understand the uh, legal context that they are working on so they won't clash with their uh, new uh, emerging technologies. So in that aspect, I would like to ask uh, Arthur, while I just finish, uh, the role of uh, the citizen lab, the sociocultural domain, in order to give the legal perspective a more proactive role than a reactive role, um, uh, what uh, he thinks about the uh, interaction between uh, uh, the legal domain and then citizens more bottom up, just like the 2OC consortium is established uh, in order to create a trust between youth and then the citizens towards uh, the uh, uh, ongoing developments, especially in the digital domain. Uh, over to you, Brad. Sarda, uh, thank you very much. And my first personal uh, apology that I noticed that you really uh, made your best effort to uh, squeeze the time of your talk. Uh, that is uh, my bad, my apology. Yeah. Now, uh, Arthur, uh, normally the plan was to give the floor to you, but due to time constraint, I will just uh, uh, aggregate all the questions and uh, post it on the chat screen. It would be very lovely if you could react to those uh, questions from your perspective on the chat screen uh, so that we could also have your perspective. I would like to uh, thank once again to uh, Arthur uh, for a fantastic speech and our three uh, beloved panelists from Master University, Tina, Yos, and Serdar. Thank you very much uh, for your input. And now I'd like to uh, immediately move to our first presentation, uh, which will be delivered by Jeremy Millard uh, from City Facilitators uh, on the governance of the circular city for climate neutrality and societal uh, sustainability. Uh, Thank you very much once again. Jeremy, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for you know, trying to keep us on time again. I'm, I'll do my best to make sure that continues. I'll just share my screen. Let's hope that it um, is working okay. Uh, let me... I guess you can't see my screen yet, right? Um, mm, not me, yet, uh, but yeah. you should be able to. If you just uh, share screen. Yeah, okay. Up, up, up. No, sorry. Perfect. Can you see it? Yes. No, no, you can see my emails, I think. Sorry. Yes, and all our conversations. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try again. I'm not used to... Uh, I'm used to working on um, Microsoft stuff, right? Uh, okay, share. Now you can see it, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, right. Um, uh, what we've we've heard up to now has been extremely interesting, and um, uh, much of it is a more of a helicopter view. I'm going to sort of dive a bit deeper uh, and unpick a bit about the um, the governance of uh, what I call the circular city um, uh, in the context of the uh, the two OC uh, project. And I was involved in some of the work on the governance with a lot of other people, um, including uh, Arthur, I, I think. And um, I want to talk a little bit about this. I'm, I think it's extremely important that we think about how all these systems are governed um, and what that, what that means and what the implications are. So um, we know from the, uh, the uh, European Commission um, uh, handbook on this, you know, which is called the uh, Proposed Mission 100 Climate Neutral Cities, that there are three principles, right? Holistic approach, to foster innovation, uh, integrated multi-level governance and collaboration between stakeholders. 
Um, and, um, you know, this in many ways for me translates into a more integrated, um, uh, into an integrated vision, one that is also agile that can be changed, uh, you know, uh, very easily. Uh, but it's also taking account of context. I mean, context is everything in, in this, I think, especially made real through proactive citizen engagement and behavioral change, social innovation, which we, which we uh, you know, need to weave into all these discussions which we have. Um, but also, even though we're focusing on the city and it's very context dependent, we need to simultaneously think about maximizing sharing and learning between cities. So um, it's um, what I call doing, moving from doing more with less to doing more with more. You're going against the grain of this lean, this discussion. We're doing more with more because we're collaborating more and we're creating in a sense what I call a city com commons, which leverages and integrates the uh, available late and often hidden assets, you know, knowledge, um, uh, resources and capabilities of all stakeholders and making those available. So, so um, yeah, this uh, I, I put this together very quickly, um, uh, thinking about the, the governance of the city region. I'm widening it slightly to the city region because I think that's you, know, you can't separate the city from its peri-urban area and, and the surrounding area. But we are thinking about in the context of where we are today that we need to think about new roles and relationships for all the stakeholders. Uh, the government, the city government itself, which doesn't have a monopoly on wisdom or resources or assets, of course, uh, but also thinking about joining up the government um, internally, so getting with the silos, uh, and not only providing basic services, which uh, is another discussion, of course, but very important, but also proactively governing the city region commons, as I talk about it. And, and from my earlier research, I think there are three or four aspects of that. We need to facilitate and orchestrate the other actors and their assets. We need to manage those assets or assist in managing those assets. We need to provide tools and supports um, in order to do that. Um, when I say we, I'm talking about the city government, of course. And overall, the, 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 uh, the goal is to ensure societal and environmental value, I think, uh, for everybody. Uh, all these things can be discussed in great detail, so I'm rushing through, of course. Uh, looking at the circular city uh, context, which is based, of course, on the ideas of the circular economy, uh, but it's also, uh, you know, linked very much to the social, environmental and biological spheres. We need to take all those into account um, as well. And you're familiar with those sort of, uh, uh, you know, familiar circular uh, models which we have here. And it's not just about environmental life cycle assessments, it's also about uh, the costing of it and the, and the social aspects and the economic aspects, uh, of course, and how to link these together. This, uh, why don't we come forward here? Okay. This diagram on, on the uh, on the right hand side here is, is something I've been working on with a lot of um, uh, colleagues, and it actually uh, illustrates, I think, quite well what Arthur was talking about—the ecosystem of ecosystems. But here I'm nesting the city ecosystem and even the household and neighbourhood ecosystem within the wider ones, of course, uh, and, and talking about uh, uh, here that we basically saying that uh, the uh, circular city, however you define that, is not cut off. Um, or excluded or isolated from, from the other scales uh, uh, demonstrated here, but it's embedded in them. And it's very important that we, you know, when we focus on the city and the circular idea of circular city, we don't forget that. In, in this basic model, what, what's going on here, and I won't talk about it in great depth, is, is that the, uh, the technological and, and, and biological materials are circulated as much as possible locally within the city. Those are the things which cause environmental damage, uh, and those are the things which can be used through circular economy and other circular aspects. But of course, not being cut off, the uh, your data and knowledge and also people circulate between all scales, of course. So, so you know, we're, we're trying to move towards this sort of model uh, for the future. Um, so just focusing on a, a bit more down into the uh, uh, circular economy and uh, circular society, and the, the, the the focus here, I think, is um, in the way that the, the debate has been going is thinking that uh, uh, unused assets or, or, or unvalued assets or wasted assets. You know, I don't want to take that to extreme, of course, but um, um, if you think about it, you know, if we're wasting all those, uh, not using all those waste materials from industrial processes, if we're not using the skills and the competencies of the excluded people, you know, we're in a sense wasting a huge potential here. So um, in, in the city, circular city context, I want to you know, focus on the fact that it's both looking at the supply side, but also demand side. And very often 
we're thinking about uh, the debate has been mainly about the supply side, but these things have changed over the last 10 years, you know, moving from on the supply side, mass production consumption to mass customization, moving from shareholder value to shared value at Michael Porter's work, uh, thinking much more about social, sustainable and frugal innovation and thinking about how the resources which we have, which are often talked about as being frugal and we have to be as, as efficient as we can. On the supply side, oh, sorry, on the demand side, the debate has always been is, is moving much more towards ownership and uh, from the ownership and exclusive use economy to new forms of shared collaborative and social consumption. So the focus is, not much, is much more now on access rather than ownership, you know, for example, using a service uh, rather than uh, owning a car, mobility rather than uh, buying a car, you know, looking at prosumers and, and, um, and co-creators as well as part of that on the demand side. Uh, right. I want to give you an example because a lot of this is it is a bit too high level, maybe I think it's useful, but I've been looking a lot at the construction industry um, and looking at it from the foundations up in two sort of leading cities in this context, Bremen and Zurich, uh, who are talking about building cities by re reusing as many materials, components and fittings as, pos as possible. Um, in Bremen, for example, about five or six years ago, the, um, the ex components exchange platform, I won't try to pronounce it in German, uh, as a brokerage market for connecting people who are going to demolish buildings with builders and renovators uh, in, in a very timely and accurate manner. So look at the, the stakeholders here, individuals, businesses, demolition companies, construction companies. The critical thing here, as we said right at the very beginning, this is basically multi-stakeholder, and, the, and these have to be have to work together. And the governance is very much often around how do we get them to work together in an efficient but also very effective way. If we go to Zurich, um, and use an interesting uh, quote here from the construction office is: "We use components again from material that is no longer needed in one place. Something new is created elsewhere." Um, and they recognize the beauty in what, <laughs> what is there, uh, which I think is an interesting quote. Um, so the, all this, of course, entails shifting mindsets, behaviors, uh, integrated governance. Um, uh, and it's uh, it, uh, uh, very often at the sort of local level, we, we're talking about real time documentation and materials passport so that uh, people who want to exchange uh, construction materials or knowledge, for example, know what is available. And they know where it's available, they know what the quality of it, they know how much it is, and, and exchange almost in real time um, uh, between people who are on the demand side and the supply side. Um, and in Zurich, for example, the, the condition was that the, this cannot cost more than building with new materials, um, which was quite challenging, of course, but they managed to achieve that on, on a three or four different interesting projects. Uh, and the city authorities noted actually that they cut CO2 uh, commissions, uh, emissions by half. Um, and that's compared to the huge effort needed to shave a few percent off using traditional methods. So there's some very interesting experiments and not just in construction across the board, which we need to look at and, and, and build upon a scale uh, using um, uh, uh, the previous comment um, and also make sure that we link these together in a, in a valuable um, governance system. Now, of course, the elephant in the room here is the COVID shock and crisis, all right? Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about retreat from globalization, maybe a boost for cities and regions. There's a lot of discussion around this at the moment. Some commentators I've heard say, oh, sit, people are gonna leave cities, it's too dangerous in cities. This is where COVID cases have been maxim, uh, at a maximum because of connectivity and because of um, so many people, uh, you know, living uh, very close to each other. But I think if you, uh, I think, I, don't, I certainly don't, personally don't uh, take that on board, but I'll come back to that. But there's been a lot of um, what I call high level impacts, global GDP gone down, huge stress in health and care and uh, social systems, increases unemployment, huge increases in absolute relative poverty. I think reversing that in the short term will be a huge challenge. Everything concerned with E, telework, e-health is of, of course, max has gone up, uh, you know, 70 or 80%. And I think there will be a reversion to physical activity, but the balance will change. So someone talked about earlier between a hybrid, uh, between digital and, and face to face. I think that's, that's really important. But looking at what the World Economic Forum is saying about the great decoupling, more deglobalized world, more role for government, um, shorter value chains, 
new forms of localization also down to the city le uh, level. And the EU is now talking about uh, open strategic autonomy, a, a trade paper published last summer, I think, on that. Um, I just want to show you this diagram from uh, uh, Ellen McCarthy Foundation, uh, another sort of view, the, but not incompatible view on what resilience means. There needs to be, in terms of sustainability, a, a balance between efficiency and resilience. Um, yeah, if you look at the window of viability in that diagram there, this is really the sweet spot where, where that balance is obtained. Because if you go to too much efficiency, you know, too much just in time, too much squeezing the assets, if you like, you get uh, brittleness when a shock happens, right? Which we've seen uh, in many cases. On the other hand, uh, if we define resilience in terms of two things, diversity and inter interconnectivity. If you go too far down on the right-hand side, you get stagnation because there's no, there's no real efficiency in that. You're wasting too many resources. So we need that, that sweet spot. And I'm, I'm defining here uh, efficiency of individual as assets, yes. We want to make sure that we use uh, get value for money, but resilience is uh, in in this view about diversity, interconnectivity, of integrated assets, more of a, a sort of governance perspective, if you like. Uh, we need both. I mean, diversity on its own, and for example, diversity of supply chains, which is one of the aspects here, would lead to disintegration and re-siloization, of course. But interconnectivity is key to this because it's about digital, as we've heard a lot, and also about people. Um, and uh, this, I think, slightly different from Tina's definition, and it's a very specific definition in this context, but I think it's, it's also quite useful in this debate. Um, finally, I just want to say that um, I think we need to think about more about the regenerative city, not just the circular city. And someone earlier talked about the five Ps. We have those on the, le on the left from the United Nations, I think they're very important. And notice nature's in there as well. So we've gone from the uh, quadruple helix to the quintuple helix, that nature should be at the table in all things. It's had 4.5 billion years of <laughs> innovation. So often we can look at what how nature solved a problem and make sure, get some hints about how we can solve problems. So on the right-hand diagram there, we're seeing um, the city in its broader sort of re, uh, rural and regional context and, and, and all the environmental aspects which are important in that. One of the things we looked at very briefly in, in, in the, the 2OC uh, context was uh, Kate Rawworth's uh, um, donut economy and donut cities, which she's doing a lot of work in. For example, Amsterdam and Copenhagen are, are two European examples there. So I'd like to finish on that. Thanks very much. Uh, hope I haven't gone too fast. So uh, over to you, no. Barak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to gain uh, time from my moderation. So if you would be so kind enough, there are a few questions raised, and if you no. could answer them during the chat. Now, I'd like to... Uh, First of all, thank you once again for this uh, lovely talk and provocative uh, uh, remarks. So I'm really looking forward to questions and remarks and your answers. I'd like to give the floor now to our next presenter, uh, Ricardo Garcia Mira from University of uh, Coruña, uh, who will uh, deliver his talk on the project entrances that are social, about social aspects of uh, energy transition. Ricardo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me to, to do this presentation in this framework, in this Sustainable Wednesday organized by your university, Burak. Well, my presentation has to do with the project that I am coordinating for the European Commission. And, um, and I will try to share, to share the screen. Sorry. Um, Can you can you leave, uh, uh, Jeremy? Can you leave? Uh, Jeremy, can you unshare your screen? I think it's uh, yes. stuck there. Okay, ah, oh, the top. Yeah, okay. okay. It, it jump from the bottom to the top, so I couldn't see. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. So well, uh, this is uh, one of the projects that uh, are part of the aim of the European Commission uh, for for reducing the 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 emissions no by at least 40 uh, percent below the 1990 levels by 2030 and uh, but while there is a broad agreement on the general aim of reaching carbon neutrality in europe uh, when it comes to planning and implementing consequent policies uh, a set of practical 
economic, social, political, and cultural problems arise. So these projects try to reinforce you know, the need to, to, to implement you know, this uh, practical and, and social specifically. And it's within the general strategy of the European Commission uh, for analyzing the social aspects of energy transition in Europe. You know? uh, so, uh, one of the more uh, debated issues uh, is how to manage the, the decarbonization process for those regions that are still heavily dependent on fossil fuel based industries or the extraction of fossil fuel themselves. So for example, coal and carbon intensive regions that are analyzed in the framework of the project. In such regions, the decarbonization policy implies also a deindustrialization of their economy a prominent effect of which is job losses and unemployment. So in this respect, it's worth stressing that on the one side, the structural change processes are already occurring in such regions so that some sort of coping strategies are already in place. And on the other side, climate policy is not the only driver of this process. So uh, the general objective of this uh, project, sorry, uh, I'm trying to... The general objective of this uh, project is uh, analyzing the social aspects of transition to clean energy, developing a theoretically based and empirically grounded understanding of cross-cutting issues related to social and human aspects. And we will do this you know, analyzing six uh, different social, different kind of social aspects you know, from the economic, uh, technical, ecological, cultural, political, and psychological aspects you know, within this, uh, um, this framework you know, that tries to analyze the coping strategies and also the gender dimension linked to each of these types, trying to provide a set of policy recommendations on best governance designs, strategies, and policy mixes for tackling these issues. And other specific objectives of the project uh, have to do with producing a comprehensive and detailed knowledge on the social aspects of the transition to clean energy as they emerge in a number of, uh, of coal and carbon intensive regions that uh, go up, up to 13 regions no? uh, as an uh, object of study. Uh, also, um, as a specific object, we, we, our aim is developing a better understanding of the differentiated problems faced by the European and coal, bar, and coal and carbon intensive regions in transition and the coping strategies they have developed. Uh, Co-creating also a, a set of policy recommendations reflecting the lessons learned from the project. And finally, contributing to the to promote a common vision on the societal implication and opportunities of the clean energy transitions. Uh, this approach you know, is made uh, trying to develop theory and, and we are now discussing the, the theory involved in, in, this, uh, in these general and specific objectives, uh, trying to provide models and evidence on key processes of transitions to clean energies in, in these regions. And we, will try to do this from these six, uh, these multiple, uh, multidimensional and, um, and multi-level no, uh, approach. <clears throat> two key processes have to do with the, with the process of deterritorialization, no, which is defined as a progressive weakening of the, of the tie between a community and its territory and trying, trying to introduce the necessary policies uh, in order to re-territorialize. You know? uh, uh, it is said uh, in order to establish a new social linkages between human, the human community and its territory. So this will involve analyze the factors of the territorialization related to these six components. Uh, as well as the effects of the territorialization and their factors in terms of societal change. So, analyzing also the, the more uh, 
the more uh, appropriate strategies of re-territorialization related to the components and uh, identifying the, the 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 drivers and the and the constraints no, uh, met uh, by the territorial actors. The general approach of the project combines th so these three uh, different perspectives. Uh, first, uh, we uh, address the, uh, our approach with a multidimensional perspective, based in the, in the six components you know, that analyzing the territorial stress and transformation, and the coping strategies uh, with six, these six components, uh, with a transversal one, which is gender. Uh, which will analyze all the, the, the dimensions and all the factors you know, that we identified. Uh, second comparative perspective that uh, is uh, identified by, uh, by a set of uh, 13 uh, cases that are diverse uh, among them, and they have a similar dependence on coal and carbon intensive uh, production. Well, the project will is, is uh, present is is the carried out in in 12 different countries with different transition stages in the in the case studies uh, trying to analyze all of them analyze the attitude toward phase out uh, identifying the different sectors involved in in the analysis of the cases uh, both in urban and rural areas that will allow us to to identify different attitudes or different strategies to to propose policy different policies and with all of them related to to the vector of energy and finally a multi-level perspective that is defined by the different cases the different models to approach the the main problem establishing a multi-level dialogue no and also a multi-level policy recommendations, both at the local level, uh, national level, and the European level. Uh, the, the different levels of analysis uh, are identified by the different uh, um, perspectives. With uh, we'll use a, a multi-theory you know, approach based in territorial stress, structural change for the socio-economical perspective, technological drama for the socio-political, or place attachment for the socio-psychological, uh, re establishing relations with the, with the individual cognition and emotion, but also with the intention to relocate or the intention to, to to copy with the um, with the problem and confront you know, with the with the local uh, si uh, new situation created by the phase out, and uh, looking at the, also at the socio ecological and technical components you know, that will use the theory of transformative capacities you know, with a level of analysis in the system. Uh, so uh, the 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 analysis will involve to study the structural change looking at the migration and unemployment, the demographic structure, fertility rate change, uh, the youth out migration and immigration related to gender in the in the analysis of territorial stress. And as I said, the, the, pro, the psychological process of place attachment not related to other theoretical aspects uh, from the social psychology like uh, social uh, identity or like uh, other emotional factors that uh, are involved in the out migration process and and the gender aspects not related to them uh, the the rise of populism and anti-democratic attitude generated here uh, with a lot of uh, speculation no? uh, attitudes from political parties organizations or uh, companies and so on uh, will allow us to to focus our analysis in the power reconfiguration of the socio-political component uh, analyzing the narrative battles for the interpretation of the energy transition and also identifying you know, the, the constituencies and local power dynamics uh, the Territorial stress will be part of the analysis, looking at the effects of populism at the territorial level, and as I said already repeatedly, the place attachment theory, you know, and how it's manifested in in the different collectives affected, impacted by the by the phase out. Uh, it will be a comparative approach of different conception of success and failure. Uh, 
it will be a, 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 a deeper analysis on the processes of deterritorialization and reterritorialization, highlighting paradoxes across different dimensions, the six different dimensions. And uh, we will look at the heterogeneity of the cases, the different phases of the decarbonization, and also the different geopolitical and cultural contexts that are part of our 13 case studies. So we have six heterogeneous approaches with a multidimensional analytic framework that uh, will explore no, the situation in 13 different case studies, uh, looking at a comparative analysis no, from the different uh, dimensions that I have just described, no, uh, establishing a, a taxonomy, uh, proposing models of interpretation, and promoting a, a dialogue of, uh, with a different kind of stakeholders in order to produce a set of policy recommendations. These are the, the coal mining regions and, and carbon intensive regions that will be object of analysis in, in the 13 case studies, all distributed in, in all the main mining regions of, uh, and carbon intensive regions of Europe. And, and well, the strengthness of the project is the consortium no, formed by 14 partners from north, south, east and west of Europe and, and belonging to 12 uh, different countries all over the continent with a strong uh, uh, strengthness in, in, in the interdisciplinary uh, training of the of the partners, you know, social psychology, sociologists, political scientists, economists, and looking all of them to the gender perspective as a cross-cutting element, uh, in, which considers the, the gender as a key dimension you know, in all the strand of the research. Well, if you want to follow the, the different aspects and, and progress of the project, you can subscribe to our newsletter or you can connect uh, the project website, which is uh, pointed out in, in this last slide. Thank you very much again, uh, Burak, for allowing to, to present uh, in this brief uh, period of time. Uh, our Thank project, you very much. And, uh, and I am sure that uh, we we will be able to create synergies with the general subject that uh, emerge from the from the from the two O consortium. Mm. Two Thank you consortium. very much. Thank you very Thank much you. for this uh, very nice introduction to Entrance's project. Uh, I would uh, kindly ask you uh, if you could uh, follow up on the chat screen uh, when the questions come up, and then uh, if you could answer them. And now I'd like to give the floor to you after thanking you once again, uh, Ricardo, to Julian Pesto, who will uh, uh, present today uh, his talk about uh, online tools to define transformational change on climate ambition through stakeholder engagement. Uh, Julian, the floor is yours. I'll be very happy if you could uh, wrap it in 10 minutes and then we will go to questions. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, I'll just share my, my screen. I'll uh, share a few slides and I'll go on to the online tool itself. Um, so very glad to present to you uh, shortly what, what we do to try to uh, help stakeholders engage on climate ambition uh, and make a lot of the things that were described earlier more concrete. Um, so Climax, it's a small organization, uh, strategy consulting, we're about 20 people. Uh, based in, in Brussels, in Belgium. Uh, and we do uh, consulting, but also regulatory advice. And, uh, and we also help in companies uh, implement projects concretely on the ground. Um, the work that I'm going to present here is built on the, the 10 years of development that we've done on, uh, on models, on, on, uh, on calculators that uh, we started to develop uh, based on the McKay calculators and then were uh, developed over time through uh, a series of projects. We started uh, at the national level, but did work at the global level, uh, also looking at, uh, at how we can connect those works to science-based targets. Uh, then we developed a, a large project over three years on EU Calc for the Commission, uh, looking at all of the, the countries uh, in Europe and, and developing this, uh, this online web tool. Uh, continue developing things at the national level with 2050 calculators. Uh, but also looked at sectors and regions and now developing this uh, at, the, at the city level uh, with the EU CityCal project that, uh, that's starting. 
Um, so really trying to look at the different scales and becoming more and more concrete. Uh, the last thing we're also doing now is looking at neighborhoods themselves, because as mentioned earlier, the, the neighborhoods is, uh, is one of the key uh, granularity where we need to work to make sure we, we uh, uh, have concrete action on the ground. Um, how, how the model uh, works, we're trying to find the sweet spot between uh, being transparent, synth synthesizing things and being very user-friendly. Uh, at the same time, encompassing the whole energy system being comprehensive and also having some details, sufficient details at the sector specific level. Uh, and we're trying to, to, to find that sweet spot there in the middle. Other models will tend to sometimes be more comprehensive and very specific on the, the system dynamics like general equilibrium models. Uh, other sectors, other models will be more sector specific. So there's a variety of models. All of them have their uses. We're just trying to find one, one specific uh, uh, use case that allows stakeholders to engage more uh, with the model. Uh, and so there's a quite a long list of, uh, of, of countries and, uh, and, and places that allowed us to develop the, the model at the world, continent, countries level. And as I was saying now at the, at the cities level, that's uh, just to give you a, a quick idea of the the, the, the amount of, uh, of work that went into, into developing this. Um, and so we're now uh, at the level where I just wanted to, to highlight here what it covers and what it doesn't do. Um, it's really about having this comprehensiveness that, uh, that various speakers talked about, ensuring that we connect the sectors uh, between themselves and understand how they uh, affect each other. Uh, it's about gathering insights from experts and, uh, and engagements with experts uh, to ensure that the model improves over time. Uh, it's about having something that's open source uh, and available online so that stakeholders can use it and share it between themselves uh, to create uh, lo low carbon scenarios. Uh, on the other hand, we're clearly not trying to develop forecasts. We're developing scenarios, but uh, those scenarios will depend on the on political and societal will. Um, the, cost and the, the cost themselves, they're computed ex post. So we're not cost optimizing uh, because we think that over time, it's very hard, particularly by 20, 30, 40, 50, to, uh, to estimate costs properly and have them drive the, the models. So we prefer to understand the cost implications, but not have them drive the model. Uh, it's also not a macroeconomic model, clearly. We're not looking into uh, the implications on, on jobs or, or GDP, but we're assessing other co-benefits. So here is a, a, a view of the, the model uh, structure. I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's too, too busy. Uh, but I just wanted to give you an idea of this idea of sector dynamics that we're trying to bring in. Uh, we, you know, if, you, if we start on the left, first of all, you see that we're connecting the national European level to the city level. We want to show the impact of what happens at the, at the national level to what happens in the city. There are connections between all of these systems uh, and we, we, we want to make sure they're, they're recognized and understood. Uh, so that allows us to connect to scopes, you know, one, two, and three uh, for cities emissions. Scope one is really what's happening directly being burnt in the city. Scope two is the electricity that's being produced outside the city. Uh, if, if it's not produced uh, on the roofs and, and, and so on. Uh, and scope three can be emissions related to the imports of food, of products, of materials. So all of that is, is part of the, the system dynamics that we talked about and that affects uh, the, the, how we can reach net zero by 2050. Um, one of the building blocks of the model is really this idea of uh, having levers that are based on four levels of ambition from a very low level of ambition, level one, more like historical trends, to level two, three, that become more ambitious, and then level four, that's more transformational. And having this allows stakeholders to really connect to concrete things uh, related to each of the sectors and each of the levers. And they can decide, well, I want to push certain levers more than others based on how transformational uh, they are and the type of, of push that I want to make in my city or in my country. Um, so the various uses that, we, that we've done with the tool is, uh, first of all, developing low carbon scenarios. So really using the model uh, across all of the sectors to explore the sector dynamics and define the type of, uh, of scenario that makes sense for a, a country or a city. 
Uh, it's also converting the existing targets uh, or the existing NECPs, uh, the targets of the scenarios, so that the stakeholders can see what those targets mean concretely. Uh, instead of just having this idea of a 40% or 55% targets for reductions, we look at the, the sectors and we see what that means concretely uh, for each of the, the levers. Uh, it's also about tracking progress. We can look at progress over time, uh, updating the, the model every year. It, exploring cost implications, uh, like connecting that to the recovery plans and the funding opportunities uh, that are available for cities or for countries particularly. And it's also exploring other non-monetary implications like air pollution, the use of resources uh, like rare metals and, and water. So those are some of the, 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 the most important user cases that, uh, that we have with the, the tool. And so the tool is really about looking at you know, various tracks, various, op various options. We can go in, uh, in, in different directions. What are the implications of these directions and, uh, and, and what do they mean concretely? So I suggest to shortly then connect to the, the tool itself so that you can see what, what it means a bit more concretely, and I can show you uh, a, um, a specific analysis, for example, on, uh, on, on uh, the circularity in transport. So you see here, you, you have the online tool with all of the levers on the left-hand side, and you can deep dive into certain sectors and certain levers that you want to, to define. So if I look at, for example, the behavioral levers, passenger distance, uh, this is setting the, the level of, uh, of transport demand per person over time and, and, and by 2050. And so you can click on the levers and understand, well, there are four trajectories, more or less ambitious. If it's very little ambition, then there's actually more and more passenger demand over time. If it's very ambitious, we manage as a society to, to structure our, our ways of, of organizing the city differently so that people can work from home, live closer to home, have a, a more uh, you know, neighborhood uh, organization where people can do all of these things closer to home, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can define more ambitious reductions here. So th these are, you know, this is one example of the, the, the travel uh, levers. Uh, there's also a, a car owner hire uh, lever. Uh, how, how will automation of, uh, of transports and the, the use of cars instead of the, the owning of cars affects the amount of, uh, of, of kilometers that are driven by vehicle and the amount of cars on the road. And so here you see how going from a, a very low utilization rate of vehicles, you could over time, you know, once the, the autonomous vehicles become available and once the, the use of cars instead of the owning of cars becomes more mainstream, have a, a large increase in the amount of, of kilometers being uh, driven by, by cars uh, and so a reduction of the fleet. So those are just two, two examples of levers. And then you can go concretely and see the impacts, for example, on the passenger demand uh, in transports and the impact on the car fleet. You see here below, this is the evolution of the, the fleet by 2020, 2025, et cetera. Uh, and you see here, for example, if we start from a, a reference scenario, there's a, an increase over time of the, of the fleet of vehicles, which, you know, if we, if we look at many cities uh, across, uh, across Europe or the world, is, is highly unsustainable. There's already too many traffic jams uh, in, in many cities. And so clearly this would be an unsustainable trend. Uh, if you go to, uh, for example, a behavior type uh, uh, scenario, then you have a significant reduction of the fleet over time. Because as you can see here, the, the behavioral levers have been pushed to a more transformational level, uh, to, to around level four on, on various uh, dimensions. Uh, and so this will also have impact then on the industry uh, because the demand for metals for the steel uh, industry, for example, will be reduced because there's fewer cars being, uh, being produced. Just wanted to give you that as a, as, a last, uh, as a last element of my presentation to show you a, a concrete use of, uh, of the tool. And then the logic of stakeholder interaction becomes of interacting with uh, a group of stakeholders on this, talking to an energy minister and highlighting some of these, uh, some of these scenarios and some of these implications. I think, uh, Burak, I'll, I'll stop to this. Just wanted to- Thank you. Highlight Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Julian. There are some uh, few questions. Uh, it was very uh, inspiring and very visual as well. If you could be so kind enough to have a look at the questions and answer them, give a response to them on the chat screen, that would be very lovely. And now uh, I'd like to uh, move to our next presentation. Uh, and then I'd like to uh, give the floor to Ana Paola Marconi. Buongiorno, Ana Paola. Uh, Buongiorno. Deliver, Thank you. A very interesting talk on gamified motivational systems for citizens' engagement and behavioral change from uh, Fondazione Bruna Kessler, if my Italian pronunciation is okay. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, today, I want to share with you some uh, of our findings uh, um, about uh, how gamified motivational systems can be exploited. Uh, first of all, to engage citizens, but most important, to um, foster uh, behavioral change towards, for instance, more sustainable habits. Uh, these, uh, the findings I will share with you emerged from uh, several uh, sustainability campaigns we organized in the last years within different uh, European projects. Uh, uh, to start, uh, some words about uh, game-based systems and gamification, uh, as we all here in the, in the last year, both from the research, uh, but also uh, practicers, uh, uh, gamification has proven to be effective uh, to attract users, to increase their engagement and their motivation. And this is true for several domains uh, from marketing, education, but also health and well-being, uh, uh, rehabilitation, for instance, but in industry and software development. And these are just few examples. However, there is still uh, um, a main limitation that most of these systems show, and it is the fact that they are, mm, it is difficult to maintain uh, the user engagement and motivation on a medium or longer term. And this is particularly relevant uh, when we talk about behavioral change, uh, because uh, the only way of uh, inducing a behavioral change and possibly transforming it into a new, more sustainable habit uh, is uh, to reiterate the new behavior, the new acquired behavior long enough and uh, being able to transform what is the, what are the extrinsic uh, motivations uh, deriving from the game itself and the game elements put in place into intrinsic motivations. So uh, as I said before, I will share with you some of the findings towards uh, how we can build successful uh, game-based sustainability systems and campaigns, uh, walking through uh, three different uh, uh, sustainability campaigns. So the first one is called Play and Go. And this, mm, all these three campaigns are all, uh, they're all built on top and developed on top of, on a, of a gamification platform that we are uh, realizing throughout the years in uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler. Um, the first one is Play and Go. Uh, this is a sustainable mobility long running campaign. So long running means six to eight months. Uh, and we also have longer uh, cases of campaigns uh, uh, targeting the general public, so all citizens. Uh, in this uh, uh, campaign, uh, citizens can earn green leaves, uh, so a virtual point based on the sustainable kilometer uh, they track through a mobile app. And th then uh, we support, for of course, different transport means, walking, biking, public transport, carpooling, and so on. And uh, there are, uh, these trips are validated by mode detection and automatic validation algorithms. Uh, um, the main, uh, it implements um, basic mechanics like points, badges, and leaderboards, but the key characteristic of this system as it evolved during time are, uh, is the fact that it, is, it uh, submits to player uh, weekly personalized challenges that require for an improvement in the behavior, and then of course reward them in case they 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 meet the, the challenge and they reach the challenge. And there are both single and multiplayer challenges, so uh, focusing both on competitive and collaborative aspects within the community of players. We had several editions throughout the years on different uh, European projects. The last one is uh, one ongoing in Ferrara uh, within the Landscape Metropolis uh, research uh, project. 
And uh, uh, what we found out is that uh, uh, this campaign um, are able, this campaign is able to maintain high the participation and engagement of the uh, players uh, for six to eight months uh, in, in, in for most of the players. And what, what was uh, surprising is that uh, the key uh, winning and the key uh, motivating factor were personalized challenges even more than real prices which were, which are assigned to uh, and given to most uh, uh, active and um, uh, most active players the second case uh, is uh, kids go green uh, here we stay within the same domain which is sustainable mobility but we move uh, to homeschool sustainable mobility uh, kids go green is a um, is a game-based educational tool that involves the whole school community in a collective journey uh, made of sustainable school trips. How it works in few words, basically teachers themselves can define on the basis of their educational interest, a virtual journey uh, of exploration, which is made of stop, stops. And then are the children themselves that report day, on a daily basis uh, they, their uh, homeschool sustainable trips. And uh, each trip make the whole group advance in the collective journey. Uh, the key motivational aspect here is the fact that uh, to each stop, uh, the teachers can associate uh, multimedia uh, material, educational material that is unlocked only upon reaching the stop. Uh, here you see some example of journeys. Uh, I, why I'm showing this? Because what we find out is that uh, the key aspect is, uh, first of all, the metaphor we used. Uh, so this, uh, this metaphor of the virtual journey is very powerful for children because it immediately delivers um, the importance uh, of uh, changing altogether our habits and how far we can reach altogether if each of us uh, uh, performs a small change. But also because another key aspect here is personalization. So we, uh, for teachers and children as well, one key aspect was the possibility of defining their own job, uh, have a percentage uh, re reduction of 55% on the number of trips taken to school. I'm not going to details here on all the other impacts, uh, but uh, um, there is also, we did also a, a set of studies where we proved that in 87% of cases uh, uh, for children, these uh, new uh, more sustainable mobility habits were maintained six months after the closure of the of the game. In this case, the games, the the, the educational games, uh, uh, they last for six to eight months, and in, in some cases, the whole year. The last uh, example is uh, We Are Robots, developed within the Innoe Research uh, European Project. Um, in this case, the focus is on e-waste and circular economy. So the idea is to uh, raise the awareness of children and their families towards uh, the reuse, reduction, and reci incorrect recycling of e-waste, uh, small uh, electronic appliances, appliances in this case. Uh, again, the target are children and school communities. Uh, we set the campaign as a uh, eight subsequent uh, challenges where children together the, with their families and involving friends and relatives uh, collect electronic items they have at home, uh, which are no longer in use uh, and uh, uh, either functioning or not. And they exploit a mobile app to um, answer to um, three questions, three to four questions that allow the system to decide that they um, the destination of that item and then they bring it to school and the system uh, together with their teacher their, um, they they understand whether this item can be reused by uh, local charities for instance uh, that can deliver it to people in need or it has a residual value and thus it can be repaired or it, it needs to be recycled so it's at the end of its life uh, also in this case, uh, children receive feedback, of course, about the collection, the CO2 saved and so on, but we exploit also a game-based uh, uh, um, motivational mechanic, which is uh, uh, the fact that children, thanks to the, all the objects they collect and their performances together as a class, they build 
uh, and upgrade their own robot. Uh, and the metaphor here is that together as a school, they are building a community, a team of robots fighting climate change. Again, here, there are two main aspects. The first one is a metaphor which is intuitive for children. The materials they are able to collect thanks to the recycling uh, of e-waste is used to build the virtual robots, but also the fact that we calibrate automatically the cost of each robot part uh, according to the performance of the whole group. Uh, to con <clears throat> also here we had uh, four uh, experiments uh, in different schools uh, and uh, uh, the, the campaigns, each campaign lasted two months. Uh, and here you see how many items have been collected uh, by these children. To conclude, uh, what we learned is that there are two main uh, um, aspects that make uh, that uh, support us in making game-based sustainability campaigns successful. The first concern, the design of the game. So not, ge not all games are fun. And uh, unfortunately, uh, now most of the gamified system exploit only uh, very basic uh, uh, game elements like points, badges, and leaderboards, while, while there are much more powerful uh, elements and concepts like mission, challenges, uh, uh, multiplayer game mechanics. Uh, and then, as in all, uh, uh, in, for all innovation, this is true for all innovation, uh, the, in this case, the game nar narrative needs to be carefully tailored to the target group and possibly co-designed together with the end users. Uh, the other aspect concerns uh, personalization. So uh, the motivational factors are absolutely personal. We are all different. Uh, and uh, user retention on the long term requires uh, to personalize, the, continuously adapt and personalize the game experience. And here is where AI can play a key role. Um, with, in all the system you've seen uh, what we do and what is also one of the main, our main expertise is we study the game experience, we analyze the, 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 the game behavior, the in-game behavior of players, uh, and uh, then we exploit it to detect which are the most uh, uh, impactful uh, motivational elements uh, and, and exploit this information to uh, generate automatically and assign personalized game content to players, uh, but also calibrate the game dynamics uh, to the real capacity and capabilities of the single player or group uh, to avoid uh, both frustration or boredom. Thank you. Anna Paula, uh, grazie mille for this uh, lovely presentation at Master University. Uh, 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 sorry, at Master University, we have a very uh, strong focus at behavioral uh, sciences too. So I'm sure there will be many uh, interests uh, on this project. And I also have- I'm looking questions. forward to collaborate with you. Have, I also have a few questions, I'll post it, but uh, just to take the uh, time uh, a bit further, I'd like to uh, now invite uh, Joven Hurry uh, from Finland, and uh, he's going to present uh, his talk on the future of work and deploying sustainability experts on demand around the world from salt.fi. Joven, the floor is yours. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Borak. Let me test. Can you see me well and hear me well? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's, so go. Good, so you can see me and hear me well, right? Yes, everything is working. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, thank you, Burak, for inviting Saul to uh, to share the, the insights that we have on the future of work. Greetings from Finland and greetings from my team from Saul as well. Uh, amazing uh, presentations that uh, we've seen so far uh, this morning, and I'm impressed by what my colleagues have shared. On my side, I'll be sharing what we've learned at SALT on deploying sustainability experts on demand around the world and the content for today. And I believe that you've been doing very well, uh, Burak, you've caught up on time and I'll uh, stick to my allotted time. <laughs> I've made it simple for a 10 minutes. There is only so much that you can say. First, I'll paint the context of our ever-changing world 
and then I'll share one key message for today. And then finally, I'll share a few case studies on how this message is being brought through in our ever-changing world. The context is clear and simple. We are all living in this pandemic time and in some parts of the world, it seems that things are easing. In other parts of the world, there is a second wave, there is a third wave and people are questioning core assumptions that they have been strongly holding close to their chest. And then we've been seeing different social movements. We've been seeing black swans as well, things coming up from nowhere. And uh, we have also seen strong, pardon, uh, strong digitization effort. Now we have artificial intelligence that allow us to argue with them. And also the IBM project debater is something that I would like you to have a look at if you are not familiar with that. This context has, has been showcased in, uh, in different books. Uh, some of you may have uh, heard about Rebecca Henderson, Reimagining Capitalism. And she is questioning the idea of capitalism itself, the structure that we have in, uh, in our world, what the companies should continue and keep going towards profits. And some of you may know about the case of the Sea of Dan and in Europe being fired for not meeting uh, the different expectations of the shareholders. We have the rise from John Elkington's opinion of green swans where we would need breakthrough solutions now. This is in contrast to the idea of black swans that we are used to. And the third one is uh, Think Again. Uh, this is a book that's been out uh, this year, and it compels us to think again about the assumptions, the beliefs that we've been having, and Adam gets us to also think about the idea of a challenge network. And this is one that I will share with you a little bit uh, in my presentation as well. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us for sustainability? What does that mean for us in terms of tackling the different wicked problems that we have seen earlier in the presentations? How do we then structure ourselves, especially the people who are going to work on these different projects? And how do we work in this new normal, in this new era? With this one, so some of our insights uh, are that there are experts that would need to be deployed. And unfortunately, the experts are not there. The experts in climate change, on, on, on cities that would need uh, to be involved in the different projects. At the same time, the world of work is changing in a way that is pulling the rug under your feet. Where are the best experts? One big conclusion is that the, ex the best experts are not within the four walls of your company not within the four walls of your institution, but you need them and you don't need them all the time. And we've noticed that to get the experts to these different projects in and get them out as quickly as possible in order to follow the different budget line items that you have has become more important. And hence the key message that I have uh, for today is SaaS, sustainability as a service. It has long been held uh, as true that we would need one person in charge of a sustainability department, CSR, and they will have all the answers for sustainability. Now, this is no longer the case. We have to marry the idea that we don't have the required expertise within our company to the fact that the world is changing as all of us here, we're carrying out uh, this conference online and we would need to connect and hence, with this distributed knowledge, how do we go on to tackle our work in order to fulfill the different expectations that we have? We have learned that whenever we are looking for expertise, we don't look for expertise from one or two people. We're looking for expertise from a team of people. So we have to assemble them, put them together, deploy them in different projects, and then get the insights and then run with these insights. One of the other things that we've noticed is that the gap, the knowing doing gap is still there. People will confuse the lots of conversations then that we will have online that 
there is action. Action is happening. When in fact, it is not happening, just the fact that you've talked about uh, things, different projects, different models, doesn't mean that these actions are being uh, carried out. So the knowing doing gap is still there. And in order to tackle them, we would need different expertise that will bring in different ideas. With this, I'll bring in some, uh, the idea that, uh, that Adam Grant brings up, which is the idea of a challenge network. You would need the experts not only to look at the different solutions to your wicked problems that you have, but also you would need uh, experts that will bring in the cognitive diversity that will allow you to question your very idea of problem, what the problem is in the very first place. So you would need that challenge network. And we've noticed that deploying ex experts that will challenge you on what your problem statement is at the very beginning. And these experts come from different regions, different cultural backgrounds, different uh, time zones. And in this way, that sharpens your skill in terms of tackling these different wicked problems. Because these problems will not go away. And you will need more and more of this diversity of knowledge. And this diversity of knowledge, you don't have it within your company, within your country, you have it outside. And hence, this makes the case for deploying these, these experts quickly and on budget and in a way that would be moving your milestones forward. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going, because we have short, such a short time, I have limited uh, my case studies to two areas. One would be for a nonprofit organization, how they are tackling this, and the other would be for profit. The nonprofit one, would be uh, NALIS, which is a nonprofit organization that is based in Japan, Next Leaders Initiative for Sustainability. And they have different initiatives, including forest, which is a co-creative ecosystem. What I want to bring to your attention for today is that the way they are tackling their wicked problem in a way that is redefining the kind of expertise that they have is NLU, which is Next Leaders University. What they're doing is that they're reaching out to the network which spans the globe. And they're asking who are the experts and who are the local experts? And the questioning of the expertise comes to the fore in that it is challenging the idea of mainstream sustainability. Are the experts uh, always the ones with the PhDs? Are the experts always the ones <clears throat> that, has, that have worked on, on, uh, on many projects? Or can you have fantastic insights from the local knowledge from, from the ground? And hence the idea of cultural sustainability that they're bringing up in order to tell the others that you can work together, you can have the idea of local to global through different ways. And they're putting different team members together in order to work locally on different local projects in order to have a greater impact. That is one of the ways in which uh, they are tackling the idea of deploying the experts and their focus areas on young professionals, young experts, because they want to invest on next generation leaders. The other case, it would be solved. And uh, what solved has is that it has an expert marketplace and it has a white label platform with these many experts from these many countries, it has gained a number of insights whereby deploying the experts while having a place where they can work, collaborate, come together, challenge one another has become more important. And to give you, an, uh, to give you uh, a concrete idea of some of the uh, cases that they've been tackling, the Do Community, Enough Lab, Loop, Nordic City Solutions, et cetera, uh, yesterday uh, itself, we had uh, a seminar with Solve and the Do School, and and the learning is that the the Do community, for example, while it is using the the platform, is able to reach out to the uh, to the other networks, and we have found this, and I will show this here, as something that is useful within an ecosystem, as you're deploying different experts, and this is where. I would bring up the idea of what this all means for you in your institution, in your company, you have your own experts. 
can you find ways in order to get your experts to work on different projects so that the project becomes the more important thing? And re this is regardless of where the experts come from, which means that you can work with experts even from your competitors, even from companies that have nothing to, uh, to share with you, but you can find something, just one thing that would click, that would get you to think differently. So in that way, that this this kind of ecosystem, this kind of ensemble is shaping the way we are looking at in terms of what an expert is, uh, who an expert is, what kind of expertise that is being brought uh, to the mix. And also questioning, is this the right, of, uh, the right kind of expertise that we need? Can we do better? Can we move uh, things forward better? With this, I will close here in order to, to keep to the time. I hope that I've been succinct and clear enough to give you just one message to the point and to get you to reflect on the kind of expertise that you have and how you can make that idea of putting together a team uh, online so that you can move forward your projects in a way that you can get clarity, you can get quality, and you can get progress uh, at the same time. Thank you. I'm happy to take any question. Thank you very much, Joven. I, for one, have uh, some questions to you. I will just also uh, write it in chat screen in a minute. Uh, and I also uh, encourage everybody to actually address uh, the questions to Joven as well, and also the uh, previous presenters. If you would be so kind enough to uh, leave the link of solve.fi also on the chat screen, it will be lovely. Now we'll take a 15 minute uh, break. And after that, uh, we will just uh, reconvene and continue our uh, uh, conference. Thank you very much and see you all in 15 minutes.
Welcome back, everybody. So now we are on time. And uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce you our next uh, presenter, Garrett uh, Kelly from Bosnia, who is going to, uh, uh, from Sea Change Net, who is going to talk about uh, planning the future inclusively, sustainable urban mobility, and citizen engagement in Southeast Europe. Garrett, it's a pleasure to see you. The floor is yours. You have 10 minutes. I'm looking forward to your talk. Great, Burak. Is it possible that you can show my slides for me since I'm being locked out of my own system here? It doesn't want to let me do it for security purposes. I've sent my oh, slideshow you not to share... you. When I try and can do the not... slideshow, it tells me there's a problem with security. It doesn't want to let me do that. Hold on. Let me have a look. So you cannot uh, share the screen? So far, that's what it's telling me, yes, because of Zoom security settings. Are you able to share my slides? I sent them to you. Sure. I'll just do that. Give me a second. Now, I'll just share my screen and then uh, see if this works. You just tell me next and then I'll just... Uh... Thanks. Thank you, Burak. <clears throat> Can you see it now? I can. Can you make it okay. a full slideshow? There you go. Yeah, hey. So uh, good Good morning, everybody. Um, very interesting talks before now. Um, go back one, Burak Sali. So I had wanted to talk to you about sustainable urban mobility. And I put in there, you'll see in brackets and other stories of citizens engagement. And I was going to start with talking about Southeast Europe, but I'm going to go beyond Southeast Europe in this because of the things I've heard this morning. So I bring you to the story. Next slide, please, Burak. But this is the story which made me realize that consultation is not, as Julian was saying, we talked to a minister, several of you have said decision makers I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me 25 years ago in community technical aid. We were called to work on a housing project and they said they had a real problem because there was a mess in there, rubbish, and uh, you know the kids were running wild and they tried to plant trees. They cleaned up the place, the architect approved it, the mayor came down, they planted the trees, they looked beautiful, they came back, watered them. After six weeks, they were all dead. And the parks people came down and they realized that every single tree had been sawed at the very root with a very fine saw and just left there. So they called us in and we came in and we realized that uh, the teenagers had had their space taken over. Nobody had been asked about the trees. They were blocking out things, etc., etc. So we went to a local kindergarten that was in the flat complex and we talked there with the community group. And what they decided to do was to do a plan with the community in which each of the children in the kindergarten would have their own tree. And then they came back and they planted new trees and each of the trees was named after the person. And those trees are still growing 25 years later. I could, could not find a photograph to show you now, but it was the thing that told me about consultation and ownership that made me see how valuable it is not just to be expert, not just to have the mayor involved, not just to do proper urban planning, not just to try and solve a problem, but to actually get the people who you want to do something to believe in what you're doing. And lots of you have talked about citizens' empowerment and behavior, and I'm concerned. Next slide, Burek. We did a lot of sustainable urban mobility planning consultation work in the region. We've worked on the EU calculator that Julien has talked about before. And in each of the stages of sustainable development, we've learned the following four principles. You can go to the next slide there and put it there. You know, the effort and the money that you put in will give you back exactly what you get. And I have never been in a project where somebody has said the stakeholder engagement is too cheap. They always say it's too expensive. You're spending too much time on it. Why are there these many facilitators? Why are you doing these many meetings? So uh, <laughs> number two is, it doesn't matter what you hear from citizens if they don't clearly see that what they talked about, 
I think it was, was it Jovan who said, or the person after him? Local expertise is often going to give you the answer you want, but since the ownership is local and they see their suggestions coming into the planning, it helps to make it more grounded. It's going back to this issue of the trees. And citizens participation is a learning process for us all. And I think we're at a new moment in terms of learning, in terms of citizens participation. So next slide. So what people are saying to me always is, surely with the right facts, we can persuade ordinary people, ordinary people to do things. And there's an excellent joint research um, a center report that's just out on understanding people, politics and decision making. And it says that facts are under attack. So seriously, facts are not going to be enough. No model, no game is going to convince people because there's other parameters at work. Next slide, please, Burak. So surely though, if we have the right technology, we won't really need the people because you know, the cars will turn up and uh, it's not true. You can plant the trees for the kids. As, as I said at the beginning, <laughs> you, can, you can do everything the right way. Technology alone, this is from Volkswagen. Technology alone will not solve the climate problem. This is Volkswagen who only deal in technology. I know it's called the people's car in translation, but they're right. So next slide, please, Burak. We have recently been involved, and I'm very proud of this, in a paper that's been published led by uh, Luis Costa from um, um, uh, Potsdam, uh, based on the EU calc modeling that uh, Julien was talking about earlier. And it shows the black text at the bottom, the crucial role of behavior in, in decarbonization of the European Union. It's at least 20% of the overall greenhouse gas emissions is going to be all about behavior change. So just to emphasize that point. And next thing there, Burak, next slide. And the International Energy Agency has come to the point where it says getting to net zero will be all about energy efficiency. And their main message in their most recent report is insights and they call them consumer behavior. I wouldn't call them that citizens behavior should underpill policy and program design. So to encourage efficiency choices. So it's very obvious that the entire direction of movement is saying that behavior is very important. The technology is not going to get us where we want to go. Next slide. And then there's the facts. Again, back to the joint research paper, uh, they said misinformed people don't think of themselves as ignorant. They hold to the facts which they believe. And I show you just one example of what's happening in the world today. You all know the famous, famous inauguration photograph for Trump and Obama and the 70 million people who voted for him and who believed that the elections were stolen. This is the challenge that we face. It's not enough to have good models, good data, parameters, pillars. We need to bring the people with us. Next slide, please, Burak. And I go back to a piece of Pew research. Uh, where do we go from here? People believe that citizens' assemblies and referendums on popular ideas should be a more important component of dealing with change related issues where everyone is involved. And we know, for example, I come from Ireland. They did a citizens assembly there on climate change. At the beginning of it, about 25% of a random population sample said the carbon tax was a good idea. By the time they had finished the year long process, I think 90% of people in that said carbon tax was a good idea. The government changed, the Greens got in, and they have for the first time in the history of climate change legislation, got targets put into and budgets allocated to their climate change targets for 2030 to 2050. And it's an incredible achievement. And I say a lot of it came down to this citizens assembly idea, which is the, let's call it not the Rolls Royce, but the Tesla of um, public participation. As we know it, it requires you to have um, a sample population, not the usual suspects, so not the mayor and the person from the main NGO, but literally 100 people who represent the mother with a divorced son who's got two kids by two different marriages, as well as the mayor's wife, etc. And it also requires to be deliberative. You don't just tell people things, you need to work through the issues with them. And it goes back to what Jovan has been saying there, Jovan has been saying, you need to get them to release their expertise to you. 
and it needs to be on multiple occasions. So that's uh, next slide there. So that's it. That's what I wanted to say. You are very far from uh, persuading most people that the behavioral changes that they need to make are worth making and the systems are there to do it, but it will require us thinking a lot less about technology and solutions and a lot more about stakeholder engagement and listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Garrett, uh, for this uh, lovely uh, cases, actually, that you uh, talked about from your experience. Much appreciated. If you would be so kind enough uh, for to answer the chat uh, questions sure. on the chat screens as they show up uh, in the coming minutes, that no would be great. Now, I'd like to uh, now invite uh, Massimiliano Massanti, give the floor to Massimiliano for his talk on... Uh, Eco innovation adoption for energy and climate in Italian SMEs, economic and geographical uh, dimension from the SEEDS uh, research group. Massimiliano, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I think you can. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I very briefly, um, can you hear me well? There is some uh, echo or some uh, some distortion in your uh, voice. If you could just uh, quickly have a look, uh, Massimiliano, if possible. Yes, I, I just lectured, so. Okay, we can just go on like that. If it is really bad, I can move heads and but I don't know. If, if it is Maybe plug it is out from the your, headphones. Yeah, yeah, plug out your headphones and use the mic from the laptop or yeah. try that. Say something. Wow. Not better. Maybe you can uh, change the microphone and speaker from your, your system. On the lower left part of the we hear something. It is difficult for me to understand, but maybe it's my earphones. No, it's all of ours. Okay, okay. So we have a, a common uh, understanding. I'm sorry, but uh, it just worked in Teams and Google 10 minutes ago, so I don't know but what is happening. Uh, it's because of the audio settings and uh, Zoom. Uh, maybe the microphone is uh, too close. If you could just put it away a little bit, maybe that is an option. No? I don't think so. No, I don't really start. I don't I can see the. That's, better. That's already better. Maybe you could just uh, start presenting, Massimiliano. Yeah. Yes. So this is my talk. Uh, uh, about, um, I'm going to present very briefly uh, uh, research virus. Uh, it's about uh, innovation and uh, the role of innovation for uh, Mas, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. 
Massimiliano, I'm sorry, it is, it is really uh, very difficult. Uh, maybe uh, we could just move to the next presentation. And in the meantime, can you actually try uh, and then uh, test if, this is, uh, if there is another headphone and earphone? And then uh, we just uh, have your presentation one after. Is that a possibility? Okay. So I'm very doubtful. Okay. So apologies. If in the meantime you could just uh, try maybe, uh, and then uh, we just move to uh, Amori. Uh, Amori, you're here. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yes. So uh, sorry for the technical uh, hiccup. Uh, Massimilian, if you could just have a look at the uh, possible uh, earphone and then uh, we just continue after Amari's presentation. Now, next, uh, we will have Amari uh, Parel from Climate Chance Association uh, from France. And he's going to talk about five years uh, after the Paris Agreement and where are the local authorities standing in terms of climate action. Amari, the floor is yours. Thank you, Borak. Thank you. Um, I'm Amari Parel, so I'm, I'm coordinating the Observatory Climate Chance uh, publications and activities. And I'll be presenting like uh, humbly the, take, the key takeaways of our last report, the synthesis report on climate action led by uh, local and subnational governments on the behalf also of the, the, the several uh, contributors to this synthesis. So every year we're trying to draw uh, a global trends of uh, their impacts and actions uh, to the main international initiatives uh, on, and networks of cities and regions, but also through academic papers, uh, database, um, newspapers, basically to overcome the lack of consolidated data and, and providing a qualitative panorama kind of. So the first point of this, uh, this edition is uh, uh, about the fact that globally there's an overall lack of uh, consistent data on emission reductions because the scope and, and accounting methodologies differ greatly from, from one inventory to another or from one city to another. Uh, even when we have, for example, the data reported to the CDP ICLE platform since 2015, after the, the COP21, it's really difficult to identify um, downward or upward trends in emissions. In the report, we have mentioned some cities that seems to have like more consistent data. But however, we have some good news and particularly relevant for the TOC uh, community. Uh, because in Europe, for example, uh, thanks to the Covenant of Mayors initiative and the analysis of the Joint Research Center, uh, it was shown that in 2020, uh, 1,800 uh, cities have uh, reduced their emissions by 25% between 2005 and 2017, uh, which is five points above uh, the 2020 European objectives already and three years in advance. Um, and also those cities are uh, representing a great share of the EU uh, with 50% of uh, its emissions and 20% of its population already. Uh, to reach their goals, uh, building and transport sectors have also have been subject to the greatest number of policies from those cities. And the GRC also details uh, the policy use, uh, depending on the size of the cities, from uh, energy management for the smallest one and to financial mechanism for to the larger one. So in the rest of the world, it's more complicated to get uh, aggregated data. So we just have uh, followed up on the flagship projects of each covenant. As for subnational governments, we also have one data available at the global level. Uh, those united in the under two coalition have uh, reported an emission reduction of 7%, uh, which is also a good signal because these coalitions of uh, subnational government represent 600 million inhabitants and 10% of the global emission. Uh, my second point is that the lack of impact data doesn't mean inaction, and we're also trying to monitor uh, all the indicators to show the increasing mobilizations in, in, of local uh, governments. I mean, firstly, like the, the simply number of cities committing uh, themselves. So with 10,500 signatories, the, all the regional covenant now cover 14% of the world populations we found uh, compared to the 11% in, uh, in two, uh, 2019. Uh, it covers almost like 50% of the population in the EU, as you can see uh, on the map on the left, but it also grows really rapidly uh, in other regions of the world, like in Latin America, for example. It's uh, much more complicated to get um, to follow up on the setting up and the implementation of action plans progress. Uh, so it's more difficult to have reliable data by, um, by regions of the world, but we also monitor like uh, on this aspect, we have also other indicators that can be valued, uh, like the numbers of cities awarded by the uh, European Energy Award, for example, 
So these initiatives have uh, awarded more than 1,000 cities now. It means that those cities have uh, implemented more than 50% of the catalog of mitigation measures proposed by the initiatives. On a more qualitative uh, note, uh, in this report, we're also trying to cover and identify uh, trends in trends in innovation and, and uh, experimentations of climate policies from cities. Uh, one is, for example, the carbon neutrality that is uh, increasingly becoming the driving force behind the local government planning. Um, almost a thousand cities and regions uh, were uh, identified as having a net zero targets. The good news, the good uh, signals is also the fact that 85% of targets are also coming along with a plan or legislative commitment. And then we also highlight like other trends like the continuations of uh, experimentations in transportation with the 1,500 uh, kilometers of uh, bicycle path uh, announced in Europe, for example, or many plans to uh, improve the densifications of activities in, in cities, uh, the multiple ways of provide, uh, providing renewable energy for inhabitants, for example. I'll just add um, one um, regarding the um, uh, interesting tools that uh, are developing some cities to give credibility to low carbon strategies. Uh, we've mentioned some case studies like Manchester's uh, carbon budget that we develop in the report, or even Oslo's uh, climate budgets too. Um, in this new edition, we have been also more interested in, in showing how uh, all these actions were integrated by national states or in a larger climate governance system. Uh, beginning with the NDC, we uh, have trying to synthesize this uh, formal analysis that found that the first round uh, already largely overlooked at the integration of uh, local governments, and also that cities were considered through a sectoral approach, meaning that they were covered like for building actions or transportation, but not as a system itself. And therefore, therefore, um, the NDC were missing the mitigation potential of the densifications of uh, citizens, activities, or infrastructure. Um, and for this report, we went also briefly into the second one of, uh, of NDC. And again, here, uh, only a handful of them mentioned their uh, cities and regions, and even fewer in the governance of their strategies. Um, we have found like no interesting mechanism in South America, for example. Uh, in Europe, it's more interesting to look at the National and Energy Climate Plan, uh, but observers consider that only Belgium, uh, Ireland, and, and Luxembourg uh, have shown a, a full understanding of, uh, of the role of communities in their implementation. Uh, to go beyond the international initiatives and, and official documents like NDC, uh, in climate change, we also have uh, initiated a uh, country analysis on the multi-level climate governance in the G20 countries. In this report in particular, we have including some uh, initial observ observations for France, Germany, Canada, and Brazil. And that shows, among other key takeaways, that uh, very few cities and regions were under low obligations, for example, or that the fact that the articulation between national, regional, or, or local level were mainly occurring at the formulation stage of the national policy, but way less on the um, implementation stage, or even less in the monitoring and evaluation stages. Um, also, in this edition, we've also looked at the growing appropriation of SDGs by local governments. Uh, many, many cities try to uh, mitigate the socioeconomic potential damages of climate policies, of their climate policy policies, and now also of the pandemic, since uh, the pandemic has not spared not a single SDG, according to the UN. So, depending on the case, we have highlighted several case studies. For example, Strasbourg and France evaluate climate plans uh, in the light of SDGs. Another interesting case was Bogota, who adapt uh, its uh, mobility plan, for example, to identify and address uh, the fact that women were not using as much as men the bicycle infrastructure, for example. And also, uh, local governments are increasingly being consulted, uh, consulted in, in, to contribute to the voluntary national reviews. Uh, submitted by national states every year to the UN, and even like many of them are, are now proposing like voluntary local reviews since 2016. And my last point is about adaptation. Uh, I won't develop much on adaptation. We also we have dedicated a global synthesis in 2019 to provide kind of an idea of uh, of the gap um, between uh, 
uh, in addressing uh, mitigation policies and adaptations among cities, uh, regions, and, and economic sectors. But maybe, maybe one thing interesting for the TOC community, TOC community is the multiplications of um, regional centers for expertise on climate and climate risks. Um, those regional centers are strengthening the, the relation between scientists and, and politicians at the local level. They can be considered as kind of a localized IPCC in a way. In the report, we covered the example of uh, some in France, like Occitania with the RECO network or the Aclimatera network in, in New Aquitaine, but also in Canada, uh, we found also two interesting cases in Quebec and Ontario. So I'll be also happy to, to discuss in details like some, some of these case studies and, and, and really interesting like trends of action from cities and, and regions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amore, for this uh, lovely presentation. I encourage everyone to uh, address the questions or remarks on, on the report that the uh, uh, Climate Chance Association uh, has published, right? I'm correct. Being yeah, published. we just published it like last, uh, last week. Yeah. Would be great if, if uh, you could just post your comments or remarks or questions. And, uh, uh, yeah. and Amore, would you be so kind enough to address, uh, answer those questions as they pop up? Next, uh, thanks once again. Next, uh, we will move to uh, our uh, next uh, presenter, uh, Daniel Calvo from Atos. Uh, hi, Daniel. I'm looking forward to listen to your talk on artificial intelligence data and robotics for climate neutral solutions, which I think will nicely uh, wrap up uh, with the beginning lecture on also data and digitalization and technology. The floor is yours, Daniel. You have 10 minutes. Thanks so much, uh, Burak. Thanks for the, for the introduction. Uh, I am sharing my screen. I hopefully uh, you can you can see it. As Burak has just said, uh, my name is Daniel Calvo, and I am the head of a team working on artificial intelligence with data and robotics technologies within Atos Research and Innovation. And during this presentation, I am going to talk about some of the uh, solutions that these new uh, technologies are bringing to climate to create climate neutral solutions uh, within the context of smart cities and communities. So uh, yeah, the the the, the world is is getting urbanized, uh, as you know, as we have seen during these uh, morning presentations. Uh, cities only cover two percent of the uh, Earth's surface, but uh, they account for uh, fifty percent of the population, seventy-five percent of the energy uh, consumption, and almost eighty percent of the uh, carbon emissions. So, and these numbers are are growing more and more because people is living. Uh, rural areas are moving to big capitals, and although mis maybe this year has been an exception due to the coronavirus pandemics, but we have seen this trend during the last uh, decades. So, uh, large uh, areas are becoming abandoned all over the world, and most of the people is concentrating on just a few highly densely populated uh, urban uh, regions or areas, causing high pressure for the public uh, services, causing uh, more crime, higher prices for the houses, and also, of course, uh, pollution. So uh, we need to act right now, and the cities must become a clear example regarding how to change our way of, of life. Uh, to be more sustainable, uh, we need to ad adopt uh, new measures, new policies uh, to uh, reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that are added to the atmosphere in two main activities, I would say. First one, to minimize uh, the emissions associated to the activities of our cities. And second one, through uh, removal and sequestration of carbon emissions uh, for just the remaining uh, ones. So uh, it is undeniable the importance of progressing towards uh, climate neutral uh, cities. And in this sense, uh, multiple stakeholders and organizations are contributing to new uh, strategies, to new visions, to new uh, initiatives uh, to progress in, in this line. For instance, the United Nations dedicated uh, a document uh, to propose some actions uh, to, inc to uh, regarding their vision to uh, have new cities with less uh, energy and uh, emissions uh, intensive uh, cities. 
and also uh, cities more more uh, resilient to to climate uh, challenges. And the priorities they defined, you can see in this slide, were around urban energy infrastructure. So how to promote new uh, renewable energy sources, uh, how to increase the energy efficiency. Uh, residential and service buildings. We are talking again, again about uh, energy efficiency, but also about how to build and to maintain more sustainable uh, buildings, uh, mobility that, of course, account for a very relevant part of the greenhouse emissions due to car engines. So we need to develop uh, more attractive, more efficient public transport systems. We need to encourage the huge uh, the usage of the bikes we need to uh, promote uh, to, to uh, take uh, policies uh, to to promote uh, the usage of alternative fuel vehicles green spaces uh, that contribute to carbon sequestration that uh, contribute to increase the quality of the air uh, waste management uh, we need to promote uh, the measures to minimize uh, waste generation how to use also uh, circular economy practices so that uh, waste can be used to create new products and new services or even to generate energy and in all these uh, priority sectors uh, digital technologies can become really uh, powerful resources and, and enablers as we will see uh, during the presentation so in this slide, you can see the complete stack of technologies that as part of Atos vision can be used to create uh, this kind of climate neutral uh, solutions for, for cities. So uh, as we are connecting more valuable assets, it's time uh, we are relying, uh, we are connecting critical infrastructures. We are exposing our data. We need cybersecurity at any part of the system. Uh, IoT the sensors and technologies can be also powerful tools to collect uh, high, high, uh, huge amounts of, of data sets that can be later be integrated with other sources of information that can be processed, uh, relying on advanced uh, capabilities of the compute continu uh, computing continuum. And then we can use uh, all these data with uh, smart data platforms, leveraging AI and automation to create modern applications and also for more intelligent uh, decision making and, and actuation. But uh, the first problem that we must address when we create uh, solutions for uh, smart cities is the, the fragmentation. Uh, even within the, the, the same city, we can find uh, some data silos. Uh, and in many cases, there are close and custom solutions that are designed, implemented and deployed to target just the specific requirements of, uh, of a particular uh, domain. And these uh, solutions are agnostic of, uh, of each other. Uh, they have their own sensors, they have their own actuators, their own uh, solutions to storage and to analyze the data and even their own uh, applications. So we need to break these silos uh, within the cities, but also between different cities in order to create holistic uh, solutions uh, to address the, the climate change. So, in this sense, uh, GAIA-X is proposing uh, new uh, standards, new common standards to ensure the, the transparency and the interoperability at the different layers of the stack from the infrastructure to the final applications and services. Uh, technically speaking, GAIA-X will allow implementing uh, sovereign data services that ensure uh, the identity of the source and the uh, source of the receiver of the data, and that will also uh, guarantee uh, usage control uh, of, uh, of the data. The data will be uh, published through uh, federated catalogs and they will also in this in this initiative are promoting uh, the adoption of some uh, po existing policies and standards that will guarantee uh, interoperability and in these uh, different layers of, uh, of the stack. And, and this vision is compatible with the one provided by international data spaces in the in the IDSA reference architecture model. Uh, they are we are we have several roles, several components, and several interactions in order to allow uh, secure and sovereign the data exchange between different data owners. So in the practice, this vision of IDSA with the Gaia X initiative, they are complementary, as I, as I was saying before, will allow to create. At, in Europe, uh, trustworthy data uh, ecosystem. 
So what are the special, some of examples of uh, particular use cases that can be created uh, using AI data and robotics uh, solutions uh, for, for climate neutral uh, solutions. Uh, for instance, uh, in the uh, H2020 with district project, we are working for uh, local and smart uh, heating and cooling uh, solutions. Uh, we are developing a digital platform that allow ingesting data from a variety of sources. And then we apply some machine learning uh, techniques in order to create models to obtain forecasts for the demand, uh, energy demand of the buildings uh, for the amount of uh, heat that can be recovered from the waste or even the generation of energy from renewable uh, sources. And with the outcomes of these models, we are able to optimize uh, the uh, behavior of the network so according to some uh, predefined uh, goals. Uh, at a different uh, level, for instance, it is quite common to find information about the energy efficiency of uh, the buildings, and we can combine uh, this information with the data coming from smart meters in order to find correlations, in order to uh, predict the energy consumption of the buildings and in this way to support smart refurbishment uh, strategies. Uh, we can also uh, use uh, images, aerial images or from the facades uh, collected through uh, drones in order to build 3D uh, digital twins of the cities uh, for, for exploring different uh, strategies like, for instance, where to place uh, solar panels. Uh, at the mobility uh, domain, uh, there is a huge amount of information that is collected by, by uh, particular vehicles or by public uh, vehicles. They have become actually uh, sensors on wheels. So uh, we can analyze using AI and big data technologies uh, the, the observations of these uh, vehicles in order to understand which are the uh, driving uh, profile patterns and to promote more, uh, let's say, uh, green uh, practices. Also, it is possible to use agent-based simulations uh, that take into account the demography uh, of the city, that take into account the typical patterns of movement within the city uh, in order to uh, optimize uh, the urban mobility and to, yeah, and to and for decision making. This, this can be also combined with AI models uh, just to uh, achieve uh, near real-time uh, inferencing. Um, of course, yeah, all digital technologies are really, really powerful, but we cannot forget that they have also an impact in terms of carbon emissions. And this impact is growing because, for instance, in the case of AI, the requirements for uh, computational capacity uh, are, are higher. And there are even some reports that say that uh, the needs uh, for training uh, a complex AI model are six times higher than uh, of manufacturing and using a car during uh, our, our life. So we cannot uh, forget about, about this part. And I think that we are going to see a lot of uh, research activities uh, regarding how to improve the sustainability of digital solutions during the next uh, years. And this is something where Atos is particularly uh, very active. So, for instance, we are developing solutions to improve the cognitive capacities of our data centers, gathering information and making decisions in real time on top of this information and trying to minimize the usage of energy and therefore the uh, carbon uh, emissions impact. So, as a summary, yeah, uh, this new generation of digital technologies uh, are, going to, are, are having a real impact uh, in the different uh, areas of, uh, of, uh, of the cities. Um, but uh, we need uh, the data. This is uh, really, really important. We need to ensure the interoperability between the different data silos. We need to create this ecosystem because without data, you know, artificial intelligence is in most cases not possible. And we need also to take a special uh, uh, attention to the carbon imp uh, emissions impact of, uh, of all these digital technologies. That is uh, an, uh, an increasing concern, I would say. 
So that's all from my side. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Um, yeah, if you have any question, it will be happy to try to answer. Muchas gracias, Daniel. Thank you very much for this. Very uh, personally, I find it very interesting, and I, I, I for sure want, uh, I for sure will just ask some questions. After I just hand now uh, the floor to the next uh, speaker, uh, Massimiliano. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Once again. Now I'd like to present the uh, last presentation uh, from Massimiliano. Can you hear uh, me? Very nice, very nicely. Okay. It, now, it was right now I, I, I'm presenting. Yes, thank you very much. The floor is yours, and uh, you're from uh, the, the research. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was teams. my fault because moving from Teams Google to Zoom, so I, I lost in translation. Um, uh, and your title is Eco Innovation Adaption for Energy yeah. and Climate in Italian yeah. SMEs, okay. Economic and Graphical Dimensions. The floor is yours, Massimo. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the invitation. I will share uh, actually a source of data um, which could be useful for interactions and, 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 uh, and possible research in future projects. So, um, moving to that, I mean, uh, the the focus in, in, on is resource productivity in, in general terms, I mean, the role of innovation behind. Uh, resource productivity, but also uh, other types of uh, uh, emission productivity. Okay, where you hear who you have, I mean, uh, just just in Italians, but you can understand, I mean, the different trends moving up. Uh, but the, the, the explanation is who, what is behind. Uh, this is not just technology. I mean, uh, um, it's, it's more knowledge. I mean, uh, uh, the IPT identity is one of the uh, framework where you know that the impact is driven by population, GDP, and then I mean, knowledge, which is not just technology as I'm, I'm going to uh, stress, but also uh, other capabilities, I mean, uh, which is absolutely absolutely relevant for the Green Deal and just transition in the links between techne and, and human resources, for example. So, uh, I mean, this is, this is the, the, the framework, so the, the role of innovation that, that, that uh, uh, I'm trying to highlight uh, very briefly. Uh, so this is me the framework uh, to, to highlight the role of innovation. Then uh, in the economics and business uh, narrative, I mean one of, of the uh, of the of, of the frameworks is the um, role of uh, innovation as a potential driver of uh, social, economic, and environmental performances. I mean uh, policy driven. Um, so the portfolio hypothesis and, and this. this uh, uh, this, this, this possible possible framework. Uh, um, I, I've used myself, I mean, some European data um, to scrutinize I mean, the role of demand and 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 and, and policies for 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 um, understanding I mean the, the dynamics. Uh, so moving ahead, uh, this is a background um, in, in in circular economy. I mean, circular economy linked to energy and and, and climate. But maybe formal innovation is not so strong. We have some evidence, for example, in some European Environment Agency reports, uh, papers by Nicola Barbieri, for example, studying patents, which is made compared to other uh, green innovation areas. I mean, uh, the circular economy uh, ground is 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 uh, more about innovation, adoption, diffusion, also patents. But I mean. The role of SMEs um, maybe um, mitigate I mean the, 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 the patenting role there. Uh, so this is another message. Uh, uh, so if you want to I mean to scrutinize um, some some papers by Nicola, Nicola he, he he has published over the, the recent years on, on on green patenting. If you have any interest, any interest in that, um, yeah. Um, so also the innovation scoreboard. I mean, um, I, I, you know it very well um, at at micro level. So this to 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 uh, understand being the the various uh, eight innovations um, from from patents to R and D to 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 uh, other dimensions. Okay, and you see that. I mean, uh, maybe one point is to 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 increase the convergence across European countries and regions as well. So. Uh, Regions, okay. Uh, then we, when we talk about the regions, we have a problem about data, maybe, which is um, a room for, for, for improvement. And here I, I finish, I'm going to, 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 to the final part and, and what I'm going to share with you. Um, uh, we we uh, carried out a pretty uh, 
uh, big investments in terms of uh, research funding. Um, so this, this survey uh, on circular economy, energy innovations, also climate covering Italy. And then we are going to, now we, we, we are carrying out the second wave uh, being, being closed in May. So we have a panel of uh, SMEs observed. Uh, so again, if, if you have an interest, we can collaborate on that. Uh, just a slide to, to, to say that, I mean, you see that maybe we, have, we move, we recover from water materials, um, even to greenhouse gas emission, innovation adoption, low, high, I don't know. It's a typical intermediate maturity of the market with 15, 20, 25% of firms. I mean, here has SMEs, so it's not big firms. So we have various typologies of innovation that we can analyze. Uh, also, the we have an, a, a question about industry, industry four, so we can integrate ec innovations and um, the dimension um, in order to analyze the complementarity. And uh, again, here I'm not uh, showing the numbers. I mean, if you want, I mean, then we have the slides, and and I, I can provide more information. Um, following your, your interest, uh, the issue is complementarity. So analyzing uh, technological innovations, organizational innovations, uh, also human resource management. Again, recall, let's recall ourselves that's been the just transition is um, achieved uh, uh, if we strongly invest in, in, in training and education in connection to, to green technologies, okay. So, uh, final slide, just to say that uh, why this could be of interest, I mean, uh, because I mean, um, here we know where those SMEs are located, which is not frequent. Uh, so we exactly know them I in the place. And uh, through that, I mean, uh, we, we can construct uh, uh, maps, uh, analyzing spillovers, clusters, and also merging innovation data with other indicators to understand I mean, the, I mean, the various geographical, uh, economic uh, um, dimensions of, of um, the innovation diffusion in a given territory, country level, regional level, and uh, beyond that. So that's for future collaboration and projects. Thanks for the attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Massimiliano. Uh, can you uh, stop uh, sharing the screen, if possible? Yeah. Now, uh, I would like to uh, once again thanks, thank you, Massimiliano, for this uh, nice talk. And uh, uh, what I would like to do is I'd like to slowly uh, close down uh, the the conference. But I have a few bunch of a bunch of people that I'd like to thank thank before I do that. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our dean uh, Peter for providing us the opportunity to host this nice event and also uh, uh, stream it on YouTube. Uh, uh, so that's uh, what you can do afterwards. After the conference, you can just still watch on YouTube if uh, you have missed some parts of the presentation and share it with your uh, colleagues and friends. But I also like to uh, take the short time I have before 12.30 uh, to thank our keynote speaker, Arthur van der Weijs, and three uh, very nice uh, uh, providers of uh, the panel discussion, discussions, uh, Tina, Jos, and uh, Serdar. Thank you very much. And I also would like to thank Jeremy, Ricardo, Julian, Ana Paula, Jovin, Garrett, Amori, Daniel, and uh, uh, finally Massimiliano individually uh, for providing a very nice content for this lively conference. Uh, this was uh, hosted by Master University in the back scenes. Uh, there were a lot of people involved making this possible despite the hiccups. And I'd like to thank Sardar, Sanae, and Sam, who has actually helped uh, organizing and providing the program. But also we got a lot of technical support, which actually helped us to prevent the hiccups. For that, I'm very grateful to Creel, Walter, Bernd, and Kendra. And finally, Elma, who is uh, with me still. Uh, please check the link to the conference in the chat screen uh, for the upcoming uh, programs. We will update the new program uh, for next week and check the website for other uh, updates of the 2OC community. And I hope to see you all on the upcoming Sustainable Wednesdays. Thank you very much.
and uh, have a very uh, fantastic day. Bye-bye.